Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you to the second day of the 10th annual SLO Symposium. My name is Jarek Janio. I'm the ESL department chair from uh, Santa Ana College School of Continuing Education, and I am the SLO, founder, uh, SLO um, Symposium founder. Um, yesterday, we had uh, very productive discussions on various topics related to assessment of student learning. It is clear that change is the only constant, especially in today's landscape with the ongoing pandemic, Zoom-based teaching and learning, new accreditation standards at California community colleges. Even artificial intelligence has made it into academia. I dare not ask what, what the future holds. This is going to be a learning experience and changing experience for all, for all of us. It really has been a decade since we began the annual event to discuss the assessment of student learning. A lot has changed over the years. We have found answers to many commonly asked questions about SLOs and have published a guide to student learning outcomes assessment. We have also held Friday SLO talks to further explore the topics. Our brand new website, coaches.institute, is now available, so please do check it out and sign up for updates and check out our blog. All of this progress is thanks to the tireless efforts of volunteers, faculty, and SLO coordinators who find the topic of assessment of student learning to be of great value in their roles as faculty leaders. They strive to ensure that our institutions empower students. Today's agenda is focused on dis discussions with leaders in the realm of student learning, outcomes-based education, institution effectiveness, and accreditation. Thank you all for, uh, thank you to our all guests and special thanks to Fresno City College staff, Enrique Hariki, SLO coordinator, Susie Nitzel, professional development coordinator, and Don Lopez, vice president of instruction at Fresno City College for organizing this event and providing technical support three years in a row. Thank you very much for joining us. Amanda, you're next. Thank you, Yarek. Uh, I just wanted to introduce a little bit more the, the coaches team on the next website. As Yarek mentioned, uh, the coaches are a group of SLO and outcomes coordinators who volunteer our time to support not only other outcomes coordinators across the California Community College, but host the and put together the SLO um, talk on most Fridays during the semester. And all of these individuals do volunteer their time because we do feel very passionately about assessment and all of us have been new outcomes coordinators and had to stumble along and find our way. So one of the additional resources you can find on the coaches website is an opportunity to ask for support and help from any of us. So I'll introduce all of us. You either have seen us as moderators from yesterday's sessions or today's sessions. Alicia Bettencourt from San Diego City College, Hiju Jang from College of San Mateo, Yarek Yanio from Santa Ana College, Enrique Yargadi from Fresno City College, Patty Manley from San Diego Miramar College, and Susie Nitzel, who is always here to support all of the efforts that we do from Fresno City College, Liza Rabanovich from San Diego Mesa College, myself from Reedley College, Bethany Tasaka from San Bernardino Valley College, and Trisha Wilging from Long Beach City Colleges. We all welcome you to the second day of the SLO Symposium and look forward to supporting you through the following year. Right on, and Eva, without any further delay, uh, welcome to day two of the 10th annual SLO Symposium. Uh, here is Bethany Tasaka, Outcomes Faculty Lead from San Bernardino Valley College to introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. Aisha Lowe, Vice Chancellor for Educational Services and Support at the California Community Colleges Chancellor's Office. Dr. Lowe has been a staunch supporter of the SLO Symposium and Friday SLO Talks. We cannot be more grateful. Thank you very much for joining us again. Bethany. Thank you. So I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Lowe this morning. Um, Dr. Lowe is a passionate educator who has dedicated her life to improving education for all students and communities. As Vice Chancellor of Educational Services and Supports for the California Community College's Chancellor's Office, Aisha provides leadership for educational services for the Educational Services Division activities, including transfer and articulation, curriculum chaptering and approval, equity programs and grants, innovations in teaching and learning, 
special project management, and system-wide technical assistance delivery. Prior to joining the Chancellor's Office in 2020, Dr. Lowe served as an Associate Professor of Education at William Jessup University, where she oversaw the thesis research of future teachers and training. She also served as the Dean of the Office of Academic Research, leading the university's strategic academic research plan and academic grant making. Additionally, Aisha served as the students, served the students of the Los Rios Community College District, Sierra College, and CSU Sacramento as an adjunct professor for over eight years. Over the past 20 years, Aisha has worked with at-risk youth, taught middle school, led educational research and policy efforts, instructed college students, and served as a university administrator. Her background includes serving as an independent consultant, supporting the research and evaluation needs of schools, organizations, and educators, serving as the executive director of Stand Up for Great Schools, and serving as director of research for the California Charter Schools Association. She brings expertise in program development and evaluation, strategic planning, research and data management, and grant making. Dr. Lowe received her bachelor's degree in psychology and her master's in sociology from Stanford University, where she also received her PhD in education. Aisha, re re Aisha researches effective strategies for educating students of color to help faculty create classroom environments of acceptance and belonging to fully support the whole student and maximize their academic outcomes, and has been a featured speaker at various conferences, including our own, and for, and for faculty professional development programs nationally. Welcome, Dr. Lowe. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Beth. And I'm like, that, that was the whole bio. It's, it, it's long. <laughs> but thank you so much uh, for the full and formal uh, bio and introduction. Uh, it's always my pleasure to share time and space uh, with you all. Uh, definitely uh, appreciate uh, those in the background of coordinating um, and, uh, and Yarek. I'm like, when Yarek calls, I come. So I'm always here, happy to be here to share space with you all. I will share my screen um, and, and get started with what I have to share here today, bringing some updates uh, from the Chancellor's Office, uh, talking about the work that we have been doing, the work that we will continue to do uh, at the Chancellor's Office, um, and of course, many connections to the work that you all do um, in the work of curriculum and assessment as well. So it's so fitting picking up on uh, actually where Yarek started, change, right? Uh, we are in a consistent time of change, and yet we know uh, that as change is in many ways forcing us to innovate, uh, we have to pick up the mantle of innovation during this era of change. So I'm just going to share some highlights about uh, how our demographics have been shifting uh, because of the pandemic, uh, what some of our key gaps are and remain to be, and then uh, really try to bring together, you know, over the last few years, uh, there's been a lot of initiatives, and I know we can often feel initiative fatigue, but wanting to bring together the various uh, initiatives and projects and programs that are moving forward, and how they really do come together into a strategic constellation of tools uh, that we are using to help us to keep pace uh, with the, the changes that are taking place. Uh, so you may have seen this before at some time. This is sort of historical headcount for the California Community Colleges. We have always uh, typically had the distinction uh, for many years of saying that we served over 2 million students. Um, and that remained the case until uh, before the pandemic. Uh, we are now post-pandemic at a headcount of about 1.8 students. Uh, so there was a significant decline uh, due to the pandemic, a decline that was coming, right? As you think about the previous graph, there was a slow and steady decline. Um, and we do know, looking at the demographic trends in California, it, it was an expectation that there would continue to be a slow and steady decline, uh, but the pandemic was a tipping point, uh, right? It greatly exacerbated that decline uh, as individuals had to make hard choices about where they were gonna focus their time and attention um, and many of the individuals in particular that we serve in community colleges who are often our most vulnerable community members uh, had to make choices to focus on their basic needs, right? And their livelihood uh, and put uh, their, their desires and their aspirations for higher education aside briefly. 
So we're seeing demographic shifts in California in general. Uh, there was quite an exodus from the state uh, during the pandemic, uh, likely individuals trying to find a more affordable place to live. Uh, as we all know, uh, well, I'm a diehard California, being a native of California, um, and certainly desire myself to stay here. If you come to a point as so many of our community members did during the pandemic, uh, where you cannot retain your job because of the requirements of the pandemic, there was just an in, uh, outflux of individuals looking for a more affordable place to land. Um, and so per the Department of Fine Lands, uh, over the past two years, the California population itself declined by 300,000 individuals uh, going off to more affordable states. Um, we also know that demographically, there has been a steady decline in the K-12 population in our state. And it is projected that that will continue an additional 11.4% uh, decline by the year 2031. And we know that has a direct impact uh, on us as community colleges. Uh, we don't have as many students coming out of the K-12 system. And then because of the pandemic, our enrollment uh, declined by 300,000 as well, again, as individuals had to make, we understand reasonable choices, uh, but choices that ultimately impacted uh, our colleges. And so looking at that, uh, breaking that down a bit more um, and disaggregating that data, you're seeing here, uh, looking at that pandemic enrollment decline by uh, racial and ethnic groups. So we see this overall decline of 16%, uh, and then we see that there are some equity gaps there, right? There are particular groups for whom uh, the pandemic uh, was more difficult, more impactful, and led to them exiting our system. You see these higher numbers here, highest in particular here uh, for our Native American and Alaska Native students. Uh, we see these higher rates here for our African American students, um, as well as our Filipino students. But Across the board, no matter a student's background, we did see some substantial declines in their ability to engage in higher education in our system, um, and as well seeing that there was uh, certainly some disproportionate impact here among our community members. Looking at that same decline uh, by gender, uh, we see there was a disproportionate impact for our male students. So that's important to know as we are thinking about who's currently sitting in your classroom and who is not. Um, it's important to know as colleges are definitely uh, laser focused on uh, increasing enrollment that there's some particular needs uh, that our male students have uh, that were exacerbated by the pandemic and therefore uh, likely necessitates uh, that we have a, a focus on some targeted outreach and support for our male students. Um, and then lastly here in terms of uh, the impact of the pandemic on enrollment, we then see some disproportionate impact also, as we look at age, now that highest number there in some ways makes sense, right? That, that decline of 28% for students age 55 and up, given the pandemic makes sense, right? We know uh, that the COVID-19 virus was particularly dangerous for older individuals. Uh, so it makes sense that for the simple sake of, of safety, right? And, and their livelihood, uh, they would have to step away and not uh, continue to try to engage in higher education and put themselves at risk. But some interesting trends here as well. I think this, this negative 21 here for the 20 to 24 year olds is interesting. We'd have to dig a little deeper to try to understand why that might be. But here too, we see across the board uh, that there were significant declines uh, in enrollment uh, in headcounts across the board for uh, individuals in our colleges, no matter what their background and age is. And so this has been such a hot topic. Uh, there is a lot of focus here on community college enrollments. Uh, how do we rebound from the pandemic? Uh, all of which is appropriate and right. Uh, but I wanna land us here. This is pre-pandemic. Uh, percent of credit students starting in 2017-18 who did not earn an award or transfer over a three-year period. So, I want to land here because the reality is part of what we are facing right now, while the pandemic absolutely had a substantial, very significant impact on our enrollment and our students' ability to continue to engage with us uh, towards their goals of higher education, the reality is this was our norm pre-pandemic. Our norm pre-pandemic is that the vast majority of our students, and you see here disaggregated across racial ethnic groups, 
after three years did not have an end result to show for the time that they had invested in our institutions. Now, previously, we didn't sort of feel the pinch of this because every year they were replaced by new students, right? New students would come in uh, every year at high levels. So when you bring together uh, what has been uh, this trend, right, of students uh, not being able to meet their goals uh, over a three-year period, and of course, the numbers would change if we look at two years versus six years and things of that nature, when you couple that with the impact of the pandemic and not having the usual influx of new students, now we're feeling the pinch. So one of the thing you, things you will hear us talking about from the chancellor's office, uh, there is a, a whole set of money that the, the legislature and the governor have provided around focusing on enrollment and persistence. You will hear us really pushing in on the persistence part uh, there. Yes, we need to focus on enrollment. We need to focus on outreach. We need to figure out, uh, you know, what are students grappling with as they're trying to decide whether or not they re-engage with us? How do we provide them the information that they need? But we really need to focus on persistence, right? What is it that we need to do to ensure that the students who come to us, uh, that they persist and they actually complete, right? They achieve that award uh, that is their goal or they achieve that transfer, they do that right within two to three years, ideally, so that we can flip this, right? I believe we would all say we agree. We love to see these all be positive, right? That 84% of our students are transferring or receiving uh, the degree or, or certificate that they came to us to achieve. So this is really the focus. This has been the focus uh, from the perspective of the chancellor's office. This was the whole impetus for the vision for success. This will continue to be the focus. Uh, is how do we not just get more students in the door, but how do we ensure that the students who uh, entrust us with their future, right? It's so important for us always to remember, uh, we serve the top 100% uh, of students in the state of California. We are the people's college, right? We are the open access college and we are the place that Californians come to when they are looking to transform their lives. So we always wanna keep that front and center how do we get to the point where we can flip these to all be in the positive uh, and we have the kind of environments that support our students to be successful? So with that in mind, uh, and also thinking about uh, where is the mind of these students right now? I wanted to share this, some very interesting uh, national data. I think the last time I was uh, with the SLO group, I referenced it, but I didn't have the slides. So I wanted to bring this information uh, because I do think it's very poignant and very telling. So you're looking at a graphic here that is a survey study that was done recently in the spring of 2022. Uh, this survey study was of recent high school graduates, about 1,700 recent high, recent high school uh, graduates. Well, not recent. They were all high school graduates. They were between the ages of 18 and 30, who did not choose to enroll in a two- or four-year college or had enrolled and dropped out. And the question for them was, what were their future plans around college? Um, and you will see here that overwhelmingly in the two green bars, uh, either that they were unsure, right? Quite a few unsure. Um, and then 13 cl clearly saying they do not intend to go to or return to college. Um, and while the, the, those two green bars are large and, and make up the majority here, and that's concerning, the opportunity for us is in that 41% that are unsure which means they could be made sure, uh, right? With the right outreach, the right information and the right environments that would entice them uh, to return to college. A very strong interest to me in additional data in this survey uh, was a question that had these individuals uh, rank their top priorities. It was so telling to me that the number one priority for these 18 to 30 year olds was being in a good place emotionally. I think that tells us a lot about the, the current and next generation of students. And hopefully it, uh, it says to us loudly, hmm, how do we make sure our colleges are that place where students can feel psychologically and emotionally safe? Uh, the students of today and, the, and of the future are telling us they're not willing to be in places where they don't feel safe. Um, and, and that's important for us to know as we think about our environments and our culture on our campuses and in our classrooms. But then second, their second highest priority was feeling financially stable, uh, which was also telling, not surprising to us, right? Uh, we are all uh, working professionals. 
Uh, we've all had various uh, backgrounds and experiences, uh, having had times in my life of experiencing poverty. That no one likes to be broke. It's not fun. It's not a fun experience. So we can understand why that's a top priority for them, right? They want to be financially stable. But when you couple those two, thing, those two things together, it should be a message to us about what our priorities, priorities should be. If these students are going to return to higher education, get off the fence that 41% that's unsure and engage and invest in higher education, we all must always remember that is an investment for our community members, irrespective of what they're paying for it. It's an investment for our community members. They're gonna want to know that after they invest time with us, it's going to lead to greater financial stability. That's all about workforce, right? They want to know that this is leading to some outcome that's going to return dividends in terms of their career and in terms of their budget and their financial stability. And they wanna know they're gonna have a positive experience, right? That it's going to be emotionally and psychologically safe for them. Continuing on then uh, with a, another study that was recently done, uh, this was in fall of 2021, a strata education survey. This was surveying adults between 18 and 65, so a broader range a little over 3,000 uh, respondents, again, asking them whether or not they intended to invest in higher education, asking them here, why not if they weren't, right? What are the perceived challenges? Of course, we see cost is top of the list, uh, right? So there's some work for us to do in particular as community colleges in our marketing and messaging. How do we market and message that we are the most affordable option, right? How do we market and message that for so many of our students, the cost will be nominal or free, right? Depending on their background and their economic level. So that's an opportunity for us in terms of our messaging about the opportunity that community colleges can offer. Life balance is second. This connects to our work around things like competency-based education, right? Trying to establish programs that are built around students, working adult students' needs, so that they can feel confident that they could en engage in higher education, but retain their job um, and manage all their, their life experiences. Of course, stress and anxiety. Uh, there is some level of stress and anxiety that naturally comes with, with engaging in higher education. But again, just a thought for us, the fear of failure, right? A thought for us about our environment. How do we ensure that we have the kind of supports that help students to navigate that process and then big one there too, 26% around that uncertain educational path. Um, looking then uh, similar results for the previous survey with the 18 to 30 year olds, again, too expensive, too stressful. Uh, really wanna highlight here, more important to get a job and make money, unsure about their major or career, right? So here again, uh, what we're hearing from uh, our perspective, community college students is, uh, they need to know that they're going to have the financial support to engage in college, but they also need to know that they're going to be able to manage college with the realities of their real lives, and they need to know what it is leading to. They need to know what it means for them in terms of career. Uh, we see here, uh, in the figure nine here, factors most likely to increase the probability of enrollment, flexible schedule, right? We, we have to grapple with the reality in our changing demographics that we will continue to see an increase in our student population of working adults. Even when we look at what we consider that traditional college student between 18 and 24 in California, right? Even there, we're talking about working adults, whether they're working part-time or full-time, they are looking for flexible schedules because this is what we have to know and the pandemic certainly taught us this. If as a community member, I have to make a choice between taking that shift at work for my job that is a uh, key to my survival and coming to your class, I'm going to go to work, right? So how do we have the sort of flexible programs, flexible schedule that allows students to do both and not feel like they're constantly stuck, stuck in between a rock and a hard place, trying to make these decisions between uh, their academic goals and their necessity of working right now and surviving. They are asking for credit for prior learning, right? That's essential. That's another initiative we're moving forward. Financial aid, uh, the Chancellor's Office continues to push and to advocate for greater financial aid uh, to cover the true cost of college for community, student, community college students. They're looking for work-based learning, right? They want to know that they're training uh, towards a, a particular goal within the workforce and having confidence that this is going to lead them to career advancement. 
more data here, but I will keep us moving forward. And then lastly here from the surveys, great opportunity for us. Uh, as you look at the survey data, these individuals actually see value in the community colleges in particular. So they have these concerns, they have these needs, but they're actually looking to the community colleges to help fill those needs. Uh, these respondents were asked if they thought the following types of higher education are of a good value. Top of the list for them was vocational training or other professional certification programs. Again, they're focused on that bottom line. How do I get into a career, a high wage job so that I can be financially stable? And then our, our us, right? Community and two year colleges, top of the list here. So there is great opportunity as community members are deciding whether or not they should continue to invest in higher education while a, vast, a great number of them uh, have either checked out or they're on the fence, there's great opportunity for us as community colleges to bring them back. But we have to have flexible programs. We have to have programs that meet their schedules and the, and the realities of their lives. We have to support their basic needs so that they don't have to uh, juxtapose uh, education against their survival. And we have to make sure there is a clear tie to workforce that they understand that there will be a, key, uh, a clear a return on their investment. So what is all of this telling us, uh, right? Deg a degree is very important uh, for community members, but it's not enough. And that's important for us to think about within the context of where we sit in this nation state uh, that is called California, right? We are a massive state. Uh, we are the 34th most populous state in the world, uh, have one of the largest uh, economies in the world. And yet, as much as I think uh, most people in the nation would say, you know, we're one of those forerunners very progressive state, only 34% of Californians have a college degree. Right? And that's a gap that we need to close. We know from the governor's uh, uh, recovery with equity plan, the governor has set an audacious goal of having some sort of uh, post-secondary attainment, whether it's certificate or degree at 70% for all Californians. We're right now uh, need to uh, make progress from that 34. <laughs> Excuse me. We know that unfortunately, and this matches the graph previously shown, depending on how you cut the co cohort, right, and how you define graduate, uh, we have levels of only somewhere, a range of 70% to 40% of CCC students graduate, right? We wanna get that uh, up. We wanna make sure that the majority of our students are reaching their goal. Only 44% of CCC to CSU transfers then graduate in another two years. So students end up spending, as we know, more than two years with us and then going off often to a CSU and again, needing to invest more than two years. Um, and as we saw in the previous graphics, the current and next generation of students is not willing to invest that kind of time, right? They're not gonna be willing to continue to delay this outcome of a change in their financial stability over six to eight years to get through our system and then a transfer degree. And then even when they get that degree, 53% of Californians with a degree are under or unemployed, right? So we have some goals to meet here around degree attainment, but we have to connect that to workforce more intentionally. We have to make sure that as we continue to implement guided pathways, as we continue our diversity, equity, and inclusion work, as we proliferate competency-based education programs and uh, in fully uh, incorporate credit for prior learning, as we do, uh, as we shift right to more performance-based uh, authentic assessments, all of the great work that we're doing, we have to ensure that these educational programs we're establishing, the pathways we are creating are pathways to something in particular. And those survey results clearly tell us students are looking for pathways to industry and they want that, they want that connection to be direct. All right, so sort of our, our traditional uh, ideology, our traditional understanding of ourselves as institutions, uh, that we're this step between high school and the four year, and it's our job to get them the course requirements they need to then move on to a four year institution. While that remains a part of our mission, we need to shift our ideology there. We need to create pathways to industry. And some of those pathways will go directly from the community college into industry. Some of those pathways will go from the community college to a four-year institution to industry, but how do we ensure that we are designing pathways for which the end goal is ultimately a workforce outcome? All of education is workforce development. Our community members are coming to our colleges because they're trying to transform their lives and get to a place of economic stability. 
So you're going to hear us pushing on this quite a bit uh, in the coming year, uh, trying to dismantle that false dichotomy between academics and workforce, trying to uh, more naturally seam those things together, right? That every program uh, should be aiming towards a workforce outcome. Every program should have incorporated within it work-based learning experiences because college is a pathway, it is not the destination. So how do we get there? Uh, part of what we have to do again is shift our mindsets and our thinking about who we are and what we do. We have inherited, right, within higher education, uh, really this ethos of, of elitism, right? That has been the ethos of higher education historically. Right, that higher education was historically a very rare experience uh, designated and reserved for the elite. Uh, and with that came this ethos of uh, you have to earn your right to be here. And if you can't be successful here, that was your problem, right? Then this wasn't a good place for you. A lot of ideology around sink or swim, pull yourself up <clears throat> by your bootstraps, never mind that you don't have boots or straps, right? <laughs> sort of a notion and ideology of. If you want to be here, you have to figure out how to be here and figure out how to make it work. How do we start to shift and really take on a, this, this student success paradigm shift that students have a right to succeed? So how do we make sure that we create the kind of environments of unconditional positive regard, of love and belonging, so they can be emotionally safe, top priority uh, for 18 to 30 year olds right now? How do we make sure that all of our policies, our practices, our structures, our programs, are focused on the student, their needs, their desired outcomes, and how do we really take on institutional responsibility for student outcomes? That if they aren't doing well, then we are failing because it's our responsibility to make sure that they are successful. So you're gonna hear from the Chancellor's Office language, a shift in our language, uh, as, we will be, uh, as we will lovingly push on the system to try to take on this new identity. Right, that we need to shift from being institutions of access to institutions focused on outcomes. That at the end of the day, uh, it really doesn't matter how much we can enroll students if they don't have an outcome right, directed towards their goals after they invest uh, time with us and entrust their futures to us. Key to the work that you all do uh, in the SLO community, pushing from conveying content to equipping with competencies and not just within a CBE program, in general, right, across all our programs, in all of teaching and learning, how do we shift from this idea, right, that, that my job is to convey this content, which we know students will, will sit in those seats. They will receive that, uh, that content, uh, sometimes far too passively. They will do the necessary cramming to do well on your exam, and they will walk away in a month later. They probably can't tell you much of what they learned in your class. So how do we shift the way we teach and learn that the focus is on mastery of competencies and take on that responsibility? Because too often we would say, well, that's that student's problem. They should have read more deeply. They should have taken notes better. How do we make sure that we're teaching in such a way that the learning is about mastery of competencies uh, and walking students through a learning journey that has them interacting, not just with information, but learning how to apply that information in ways that will stick better, right? We know that from the study of psychology, that when you take information, but then have to actually apply it and work with it hands-on, it's going to be more deeply encoded for you into your long-term memory and can turn into real mastery of competencies. And that's what they need. And when we connect that to workforce, then the through line will make sense. We're teaching you that not just the information, but this knowledge and the skills you will need when you go off into this industry. While we have certainly as a system taking on more of an ideology of completion, and we should retain that, right? Completion is an important aspect of success. And as we saw in the data, we still have a long way to go to say that we are completion institution. We need to now bridge that to not just completion is success, but what happens after completion? right, that the high wage job and the transform life is actually our measure of success. And how do we shift from a focus on institutional needing good to public needing good? We are public institution. Taxpayer dollars, our dollars, right, we're taxpayers, uh, funnel back into our colleges to support a public need and a public good, which is about ensuring that the vast majority of Californians 
can have high wage jobs, sustainable wages, uh, because that ultimately is good for all of us, right? When the people are good, the community is good, when the state thrives, that has a direct impact on all of our lives and the quality of our lives. And so the vision for success remains our North Star. We will continue to focus on the goals of the vision for success. Um, <clears throat> I will not go over this today, but we do have uh, data on where we are on the vision for success goals. We've made progress on all of them, but we cannot say we have met them, right? We still have glaring equity gaps uh, by racial and ethnic group. We still have regional equity gaps. Uh, we have very slightly decreased <laughs> the unit accumulation we have not reached the goal around unit accumulation. We have increased by 15% transfer to CSU and UC, but we did not meet the goal uh, that we set of 35%. So we will continue to work towards these goals of the vision for success. Uh, we will overlay that now with the goals that the governor has set for the state of California in his recovery with equity plan. If you have not read this plan, uh, I would highly recommend that you do so, right? This is again, our state leadership laying out a roadmap for higher education, uh, setting some very specific and audacious goals um, in both the, our system, the community college system, CSU and UC have all agreed to partner with the governor in helping to meet these goals. Now we just have to figure out how do we get there? How do we get to 70% post-secondary degree and certificate attainment? Uh, that is an audacious goal. It's a bold goal, but it's good to, to set, uh, you know, audacious and bold goals. But now we have to figure out how we get there. We know part of the work for us as community colleges, it will build on the vision for success. We must reduce the time um, and units to degree, right? Having these clear, clear and more clearly laid out pathways for students so that they don't spend as much time floundering, uh, taking various courses, trying to figure out you know, what, what they need to do, that we're able to say to them very clearly, where do you wanna to get to? You wanna be this, here's the pathway, right? You wanna do this, here's the pathway and have that clearly laid out for them. We will continue to focus on closing equity gaps. Uh, we will increase our focus on dual enrollment. There's a strong focus on dual enrollment in the governor's plan, which again, towards the thought of getting students on a pathway makes complete sense, we support that. The Chancellor's Office does have a strategic framework for dual enrollment that we will be rolling out. How do we really use dual enrollment as an equity gap closing tool, as a completion strategy? How do we make sure that our duly enrolled high school students aren't just sort of taking classes just to get some college credit, but they're actually beginning their pathway uh, to their future life, their future career? We'll double down on our work with our intersegmental partners so that we can really establish a seamless transfer process and of course, focusing on not just transfer, but career. All right, I'm gonna move through some of this more quickly because we are running out of time. Uh, so some of the key initiatives for us uh, will remain. Uh, we will continue to uh, focus on full implementation support for the student-centered funding formula. I know that was a controversial one, but the reality is at some point in some level, we have to be held accountable for students' outcomes. Right, We can't continue to simply receive funding because we exist. It's always important to remember that performance-based piece of the student Senate funding formula is just a percentage. The majority of our funding is still based on enrollment. We will continue to push on remedial education reform. Some people love it, some people hate it. It's the law, we will continue to implement it. The data is very clear. This is the single greatest equity reform of our time. So please check out uh, the informational update we just gave at the Board of Governors this past Monday, uh, where we went over uh, the, the most recent data and we are seeing, it does not matter a student's racial ethnic background, it does not matter any of their other uh, student demographics, right? In terms of, we looked at foster youth, EOPNS, veterans, et cetera. It does not matter our students with disabilities, we disaggregated that by the disability type. It does not matter their high school preparation, Literally, we have cut this data in every way uh, we have been asked to to address all of the questions we are seeing across the board. Students are more likely to successfully complete the transfer level courses when they start in the transfer level courses. So we will continue that work, guided pathways, our DEI work, um, and of course, our focus on financial stability, meeting students' basic needs, and a stronger focus on their health and mental wellness uh, because people are struggling. Uh, the pandemic has been hard. 
Uh, you all know, without the pandemic, adulting is just hard, uh, right, and, and difficult. And so we want to have uh, really trauma-informed uh, mental health supports for our students. So how does this constellation come together? It can often feel like a bunch of different initiatives, but it's really not, right? Dual enrollment, equitable placement support and completion, that's our remedial education uh, reform, credit for prior learning, competency-based education, work experience, our new baccalaureate degrees. All of this is about a set in, setting the enabling conditions and giving you and your colleges the tools you need to establish transformative pathways for students uh, through higher education into their career. Similarly, a focus here on uh, transformative pathways. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Let me keep going, let me keep going. It's guided pathways in action. Similarly here around student supports, right? So the DEIA work, uh, we have an accessibility universal design, design task force that's about to launch, making sure that colleges have the resources that they need to effectively serve our students with disabilities. We've been talking a lot of the chancellor's office about the social determinants of success, right? That in order for students to be successful, they have to have their basic needs met. Uh, so how do we ensure uh, that we can provide students those resources? Campus climate and campus safety uh, in the wake of uh, the racial reckoning of 2020 as a part of the chancellor's office call to action, there was a focus on the role we play in police training at our community colleges and how do we uh, sort of really look at even the presence of police on our campuses. There's a whole task force uh, that did some amazing work to come up with specific uh, recommendations and there were changes to regulation. We also have common course numbering, which again, even though we did not ask for common course numbering, uh, it is here and we're, we're gonna take what was given to us, uh, you know, as we say, take those lemons and make lemonade. Uh, we, we like to say at the chancellor's office, we're gonna take uh, those limes and make a top shelf margarita, right? We're gonna make sure that that's useful and helpful for our system because there is an element of, as a students move across our campuses because they do at high levels, that credits follow them easily because uh, we brought together not just our course numbering, but our alignment of content. And then how do we make that connection with our four-year partners so that it easily transfers as well. And then last but certainly not least, our focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, which simplified is centering students' needs, right? We can sometimes complicate that work at its, at its simple core. DEIA work means know what your students need and figure out how to meet the needs. That's what it means. So how do we cultivate these environments of love and belonging? How do we make sure that we have diverse, but not just diverse, but culturally competent administrators, faculty, and staff? How do we make sure we have culturally responsive uh, pedagogy and relevant curriculum? Again, having that trauma-informed basic needs and mental health supports. I wanna emphasize that trauma. Right? We need to shift our practices. We need to stop requiring students to prove their poverty every time they need something. How do we create some seamless systems where when a student enters our system, they fill out one form, they fill it out once, and we just connect them to all the resources they need, right? And we stop asking them to prove that they need these resources. The resources exist, it's taxpayer money. It was given to us for those purposes. Let's get those resources to our students. And of course, we'll continue to push on a financial and political advocacy and accountability for students. I'm going to stop there and just simply say the chancellor's office is here to support you and serve you. You're seeing a graphic that's hot off the presses that is not yet public, uh, but that is sort of the redesign of our office. Uh, I, sit, I sit here in our, uh, our office of equitable student learning experience and impact, uh, but we are here to serve you. We're here to help you to do this work, to provide the enabling conditions for you to do the work. Um, and we are always open for you to let us know what you need, how we can be helpful um, as you all help to transform California. We are the secret to meeting that 70% attainment goal, right? It cannot be reached without the community colleges. So we're excited for the work of HEAD. I'll turn it back to you, Dart. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. This is very, very inspirational. Thank you again for, 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 for your support. We do have a couple of questions, I think, from Bethany and Amanda, if you, if you would like to please. Yes, a few, few more minutes. Uh, Bethany, please. 
Sure. So, uh, Dr. Lowe, yesterday we heard from Capella University, a CBE university, that their students can enroll in their school essentially every week, right? Not just two or three times per year. Has there been any discussion about these flexible entry points within the California Community College system? Yes, there is. So our CBE pilot um, is still underway. It is a multi-year pilot because as, as we try to establish these direct assessment CBE programs, there's just so much that colleges have to think about, have to transition. But one of the things that we're working through is those potential structures. So you will see within our CBE program, this opportunity for multiple starts. Now, colleges will decide if they want to do it. Is it weekly? Is it, is it monthly? Or, or what the case might be there specifically. But yes, you're going to see this opportunity where there's really just sort of this, this rolling starts that take place uh, where students can start at different points. They will all uh, transition and move through uh, their competencies at different levels. And so when you think about CBE, you want to think about things that we know. One, think about our PACE programs. Right, so company-based education is similar to our PACE programs in that students are not taking classes and figuring out their way. Their program is laid out for them from beginning to end, right? They have competency sets, right? We're really taking courses and programs that currently exist, disaggregating them into the, the competency, right? Uh, having then those, those assessments of competencies, but all of it is laid out from beginning to end and students have a, a, a clear pathway along the way. You also wanna think of it though, as similar to open entry, open exit, in that uh, as students engage in their CBE program, it allows them the flexibility to move faster if they are able to, or to take more time. It also doesn't penalize them when they have to pause, right? If life happens and they have to pause, there's not sort of this, oh, now you're out the program and you'd have to completely re-engage. Uh, it's like our remotes or our televisions, they can literally Press, press pause and come back to where they were and pick back up. And yet it's unlike anything that we have in that in exchange for that flexibility, students have to perform at a higher level, right? So students must master competencies at 80% so or B or higher. So no longer can they pass uh, with, with a C or a D. They have to master competencies at a higher level. And mastery is demonstrated by them actually being able to show that they can take this knowledge and apply it. So assessments are more authentic and performative um, and they have to be able to pass those assessments at a higher level. But we bring all that together to provide this more flexible space for these working adults that are increasing population. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lowe. I've, I've got the next question, and there might not be enough time for this. I know I take so many screenshots and have so many great um, ideas and sent messages to my to my colleagues about all the wonderful things that you you said. So um, I, I have a, a rather challenging question. Maybe we're talking a lot about credit for prior learning, competency based education, um, you know, all of these great structures. Um, and yet a, a measure of institutional success still isn't on student learning, but rather on things like diploma attainment or uh, transfer rates. Um, and, and we do see this, this shift in the importance of things like competency-based learning and looking at skills, but we also, it, there doesn't, yet have an emphasis on what makes an institutional successful is how they support student learning. So I don't know if you mm -hmm. want to, uh, if you had a moment to address um, that question. No, and so you'll see that shift in CBE as well. I'm like, um, Aaron, cover your ears or don't tell anybody, we'll, we'll be bringing this to the collaborative. But part of the work, not just on the pilot for, for, for designing these CBE programs, there's also a set of work on designing an apportionment model specific to CBE. What you will see in that draft model, which we will be bringing soon to the collaborative, is uh, a, a portion of that payment that's actually based on as students master, the college gets more money, right? So you will see within CBE in particular, a move in that direction uh, to really focus on this bottom line of are students actually learning, right? Are they learning the information? I could definitely foresee, not that this is on the docket right now, uh, but you, you will see, you know, within our statewide curriculum committee 5C, right? In the coming years, as having conversations about that, uh, us having conversations about, okay, in addition to the CBE pilot, how do we start to just move in this direction, 
right? And how might we use regulations to help us move in this direction that the focus of teaching and learning is actually the learning part and how do we start to shift from sort of these bottom lines of, well, they put in the time and they got this minimum grade to uh, really ensuring the students have mastered the content and information so that as they transfer or as they go into workforce, they're ready to perform. Uh, whether that's perform academically at a four-year institution or perform uh, functionally uh, within industry and on their job. Um, and in some ways, even though we did not ask for AB 928, AB 928 is gonna help push us in that direction. As uh, UC and, and CSU come together on uh, this one unified pattern of GE, the question that that naturally then brings up is, okay, well, how do we get into alignment on what it means for students to have successfully completed this GE pattern? It's pushing us in that direction to start to talk about competencies and aligning on competencies across our systems. So I think we'll see more of that in the coming years. Great. That's so encouraging, especially for all of us who are in the outcomes and assessment world. Um, we love hearing that that's going to be of, of greater importance moving forward. Absolutely. And you all share with us any great work you're doing. Please share that with the chancellor's office. You're doing some great work around authentic assessments. If you're doing some great work around building a competency model, even in traditional programs, please share with us anything you're working on, good models, good templates, good resources. I will put uh, my email in the chat. We want that information uh, because we want to have opportunities to learn from the good work that's already taking place. So please do send us anything uh, that you might be working on at your colleges as well. Excellent. Indeed, Amanda, we've been waiting uh, years, years, Dr. Lowe, for, for, for those statements to be made. So we are, we are just so very appreciative here. Amanda is absolutely right. Music to our ears. Looking forward for further collaboration and thank you very much for putting it in such such very, very promising perspective for us. Just further grateful. Uh, uh, Bethany, anything else? Any any last minute comments, questions that 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 came up? <laughs> I think I think we do have questions. Do we have time to ask more or uh, maybe yeah. just one short one? Um, so another question, Dr. Lowe, is uh, we saw that students between the ages of 19 and 24, right, they're young, they're ready for school, um, but if they're choosing not to go into that educational path, do we have data on where they're going instead? Are we able to track that at all? So we don't have that data. Uh, we, of course, we are waiting for our, our cradle to career data system, right, so that we can track that sort of information, because that is the question. What are they choosing to do instead? Um, and is it that they're choosing to work? Uh, is it that they're, they're, they're choosing other institutions that aren't public institutions that we can't track? Um, I think interestingly with this generation, I would, my hunch would be that we're gonna see a couple of different things, right? Uh, my hunch would be that part of what we're gonna see is students going into work. Uh, my hunch would be if we could track down the data, I'm really interested in knowing how many students are being enticed by these programs that industry has put out that's saying, come to us, we'll give you real training here, uh, right, here with Google, right, here with Intel, and we'll get you right into a job. So I'm wondering how much that is a factor uh, that would, it would be good to tease out. Uh, we do wonder, and again, we need our, our full state system to better track, or are they just going off to, you know, smaller liberal arts institutions, private institutions across uh, the state? Uh, but this next generation is interesting. They seem so much more willing um, to just explore so much more willing to like take time to figure it out and figure out who they are, right? And I think it's just the influence of social media and other things. Some of them may be spending time building YouTubes because because they're trying to become a social media influencer. Who knows, right? So so many things are, are enticing to this next generation, but uh, we don't have the data we need to really understand what's going on with them, but um, hopeful that we can get more data in the, in the not too distant future. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. Um, so we're gonna take a short break until our next uh, speakers are here at 9 a.m. So if you need to you know, get up and stretch and wiggle around a little bit, uh, this is the time, but we're just so grateful for you and for your time, Dr. Lowe. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Always glad to be with you all. Thank you very much.
Good morning. It is it is nine o'clock. Uh, let's move on with our program. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Aaron Zettner uh, from uh, Coastline College. Uh, he's a colleague of mine for, oh gosh, longer than I want to remember now, right? It's been a while. <laughs> uh, Aaron has always been very supportive of any of our uh, SLO-related discussions from uh, institutional uh, effectiveness perspective. Uh, so Aaron, if you could please um, introduce yourself in, in perhaps a bit greater detail. Tell us what you're thinking about these days. What's what's on your agenda? So it's very interesting. That's a really good question. So just as a brief snapshot about my background, I've worked in institutional effectiveness for over a decade. I've, I've known Yarek since SLO um, Symposium number one, and I've been lucky to attend every one of them. They just continue to be really awesome. I think uh, just my background uh, to just give a, a actual play into the questions and the answers that that we'll be giving today is my background isn't traditionally in higher education. I have a doctorate in business administration with an emphasis in strategy and innovation. Kind of looking at something when numbers don't exist. What do you do? What decisions do you make? How do you make them? How do you facilitate change leading to future action? You know, it, it's kind of like when you spaghetti something out there in a decision tree model, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And as you see, it's starting to emerge as a popular theme in AI. In addition to being a dean, I also teach. I've been doing that for about seven years in undergraduate and graduate level uh, data science. So uh, chat GPT, things like this. This is not new for me, but it's 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 exciting to see how it's emerging out. And so uh, some of the things I've been doing lately is uh, writing curriculum at the gra uh, graduate level in, in those areas with data science and, mm -hmm. and leadership and institutional effectiveness. And then uh, I actually am sitting on a panel with around 47 other faculty from across the world to write the framework for how to utilize chat GPT in, in article development and how would you use it either as a citation, as a resource, and how to leverage that and help try to create parameters. And so we're at the very infancy stages of that. That article will be published out pretty soon. And so, nice. and then uh, as you alluded to, as one of uh, the top video people on, on the channel, uh, we uh, we have something called Data and Donuts. It's a completely free and there's no money gained anywhere on that um, channel where we talk to professionals within our field just to hear perspectives and insight on on uh, what would you even say uh, a variety of topics across higher education from student learning outcomes to equity to uh, student success and the like. And so it's just something fun that why not. Right. And so I think that's just a few things I've, I've been working on lately. Very, very cool. Thank you. Very timely work indeed. And, and I'm sure it's going to be very insightful. I had uh, three sessions talking about um, artificial intelligence yesterday. And I, and I tell you, it's a, it's a very, very, very important field for us to explore uh, in, in, in weeks, if not years, obviously, to come. So we'll, we'll exchange some thoughts on that topic as well. Um, Aaron, from, from, from your perspective, um, from from the perspective of uh, institutional effectiveness uh, professional, uh, as new faculty come in, you you mentioned very important aspect of it. What do you do? How do you talk about student learning? There is no data for it, right? There's nothing that really. Uh, Dr. Lowe again uh, said said what she just 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 did, which is very very promising. That there is going to be some some guideline to colleges, and ultimately. Uh, money will start flowing in the direction of uh, foc of, of uh, focused um, attempts to 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 um, articulate student learning to address student learning. So I'm I'm certainly looking forward to it. What's your take on this? So so there's a variety of perspectives on on this situation. I think if if we want to take a step back, I, I remember we when SLOs were kind of first introduced like a billion years ago. At this point. It was really going through a lens of bureaucracy, like you right. have to do this because, you know, here's why. And then if if anyone's familiar with like some popular Harvard articles about the leadership with a with a stick or a carrot, where you know you this is required for accreditation. Basically, we're gonna close our college if you don't do this. You're gonna have a job, and so a lot of fear was driving into that. And 
it led to a lot of box checking. But then others tried to do a positive spin saying, we'll give you resources if you do this, aka more box checking. And so and so the approach that we've been taking over time, and, and I'll, I'll speak from working at multiple schools where box checking had occurred a lot, because, you know, we didn't want to get in trouble. We want to make sure we we're meeting the marks. To really reflecting on people. I remember my first meeting with someone who we, we decided this would be the great faculty SLO coordinator. Like my first week at work at Coastline was, I was told, this is meaningless. We're just doing this to get by for the accreditation. And I was like, that's a great question. And so at over grants, we ended up getting a grant regarding this to say, how do we make SLOs meaningful? And basically restarted from scratch. And, and that was one of the most promising things that we ended up doing at our institution. But really taking that into account is what is SLOs? Why are we doing this? And, and talking about teaching and learning over time, every time, and I don't know if anybody else does this, but after talking to Yark, it seems like everybody does this. You're in a class, you're teaching either in person, online, online, live, hybrid, whatever modality you're in. And you're seeing something's working. Everything's gelling. Like, this is great. Let's continue with this process on how I'm teaching students, watching them engage and learn. Or what if you see the other end? It's like, hey, nobody got, off, got this topic. You know, what did I do? What did I do differently? You adjust. You don't just keep doing the same thing and, and not seeing any gains on that. And so... The theory behind at least what, what we've been sharing of SLOs is as you're observing the way you're teaching, what are you doing differently? Mm -hmm. You don't just like plug, play, walk away. I mean, maybe you do, but in this day and age where everybody's really focused on content to meet where, them where they are, how are you adjusting to do that? Because not your students are not always going to be the same individuals, the same learning, have the same learning techniques and the like. And so in framing that, really thinking about that, that's what we really wanted to garner out of the student learning assessment process is not just a quantitative thing to say how many people passed, yes or no, but what have you done differently? And really have that as a reflection point as something for faculty to share amongst faculty in a way that, hey, going to, not to go into a system, click 5,000 buttons and then get lost in a maze of, of trivia, but in a way where they can consume information and share because that's the ideal state of of SLOs, at least in our perspective at my school and then for myself, is how do you continue to create that learning quality, you know, that instructional expertise? You know, you can't give the same test in the same lecture a thousand times. You have to switch it up. And where and how do you document and share that story? And that's the key aspect of how do you share that story? And I think that's where the SLO assessments really help that. Well, it can help show like, hey, at this point in time, Students are grasping this information based on a demonstration, based on a set of whatever um, assessment activities you have. How do you continue to build upon that? Because this assessment activities won't, shouldn't be the same every time. I, I think that's something that, that we need to continue to progress as far as we create the quality of our instruction, our quality of engagement, and really strengthen the quality of learning and, and opportunity for learning for our students. So I think to me, how I've approached SLOs with new faculty is really about, you know, here's the process we use to learn about your best practices that we can share with others mm -hmm. and start down that fact uh, about around that way. I don't say, Hey, you have to do this, this, and this, but in partnership with faculty, because we have faculty SLO coordinators that work in my department, you know, these are like what you have here as coaches, your individuals to engage. Here's what we're trying to achieve. And I think that's the key aspect is how are you trying to help students to that next level? And tell us what your perspective is, because we may, may may have an area where we don't see that at this point. So that's how we've approached it. Perfect. That's that's a very insightful answer. It's it, very true. It's teaching and learning in tandem. And, and we do need to be mindful of, 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 of the two happening uh, in the classroom, improving on both. Uh, great point. Um, during the, um, the panel discussion yesterday, we talked quite a bit about the value of higher education. And you already said that you have some curriculum writing experience. What role do you think in SLO assessment could be played by the students? How are they involved? Is there a better way to inform students of outcomes than just checking the box, putting them on the syllabus? And then what would SLO assessment data tell students about the value of higher education? 
So I really think students play a crucial role throughout the SLO process, not just through the development, but all the way through the assessment, the feedback. And so similar to what you said, is it's in the syllabus. Like, that's great, cool story. If they click on that page or if they flip to that page in your syllabus, right? But that's almost the intention of, you know, after going to this class, here's what you're going to be able to demonstrate and do. And it goes back to the purpose. And the purpose is many of us who either teach online or even teach in person is how you open, once again, helping the student have that feeling of belong. Dr. Lowe touched on this is how do we create that? And how do you bring meaningfulness to your class? Like if you're teaching a class and you're saying like, and I'll give you an example. I taught business law. I hated business law when I went to college. It was the worst. And so when I was teaching business law, the approach that, that I had used to that is, why are you taking this class? You know, how do you see this applying to you? That's the first question I ask the students when they introduce themselves in person, online. How do you see this impacting you? And, you know, and here's what the outcomes are of this class, you know, following up with the students after everybody shared what they were gotten. Now, a lot of people are like, because I have to. That's a great question. But having that reflection almost um, as they go through their learning process on a weekly basis, as my, my peers and colleagues have done, is, you know, how do you find this applicable to what you're doing? Not just the content that we covered at the overall course, but on a weekly basis. But then summarizing that at the end to say, you know, what were those key aspects that are going to really impact you? Because I think what was mentioned earlier is how do you tie that to either life, work, so on and so forth? Like not just, hey, I regurgitated some terms. Okay, what's that going to do? You know, but how are you going to apply that? How's that going to shift your behavior over time based on our learning? And so I see that as more of a feedback loop with the students is how do you feel you are learning? And then I think that really helps shape, like as we write SLOs, are they clear? Are they understandable? Can someone say, hey, you know, I went to, to Yark's ESL course. By the end of this course, here's what I'm going to be able to do. Yes. So it's almost setting them to a trajectory like, to the end game to say, you know, by the end of this point, and then these skills or competencies or things you're learning are important because, and then reinforcing that throughout the course, you know, and then as we create activities, learning activities, or even um, demonstration activities, how does that tie back to really building upon that skill and reinforcing that learning? And I think uh, sometimes, and I've seen it many times, and I've done it myself, where it's just like one assignment and see solo and it's done. What if they had a bad day? Like, how do you create a culminizing thing that really works over time? And logically putting that through. And so, I really feel a student's approach, not just going through the assessments, but gaining their feedback on why the SLOs are important, how does it apply to their lives, and then say, if you need to make those adjustments, make those adjustments based on that feedback. Now, not like off of two people's feedback, you're going to change your whole course, but if you see that trend over time, or you see commonality, like, why are you doing this? I think that's opportunities for recommendation. So I think that's where I see the students um, in that. And like I said, I can't emphasize more is like, even on at the end of any assignment you do ask, like, you know, what were the key aspects of that? Or even the, at, at the end of a week, like, what did you gain from this? You know, because it can really shape how you adjust your course or even how you teach towards those learning outcomes or really reinforce that. Excellent. That's that's uh, again music to my ears. There is a there is a, uh, a question or comment in the in the uh, chat. Uh, Alpa, would you would you mind elaborating on this a little bit? What 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 is your practice? I'll I'll just wait for Alpa to unmute. Uh, let me see. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Let me check. Okay, I think now I was like, what? I can't unmute myself. Oh, yeah. So I noticed how, you know, we we put such emphasis on SLOs, right? And students are like, what? I don't know. They go to the table, schedule, like, when is the exam due? Right? Like, that's their focus. Um, and so just to kind of bring them more into uh, the big idea, right? And so I, I do that. And I tell them just, just it's informal. First day of classes, read through them and tell me what, which one are you looking forward to the most and why? Uh, and so it's informal, but at least it makes them go there. Uh, and then we have a nice, you know, robust conversation on the very first day of class, right? And that they are now 
they're, they're part of the process, right? That they're part of this learning dialogue. And I, and I always emphasize, you know, always, I shouldn't say always, I just developed this new way of doing things and where now my classroom is this dialogue rather than a monologue, right? It's not me just telling them what they need to do, it's their um, input. So that's what I'm doing. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, is, a, that is a great, awesome. great, great, great practice. Thank you so much for, for the insights. Uh, Aaron, so uh, continuing the discussion about uh, data and student learning assessment data, uh, you know that we are in this data-driven universe, right? And, and, and these days, as long as we use the word outcome in a conversation, then we are done. Now, without necessarily specifying that we are talking about your student learning outcomes or really results of, 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 of anything else. So what do you think are the dangers, right? What are the challenges with the data interpretations for faculty? What if students have access to that data? Do you see any issues and how it would actually student learning outcomes assessment data help us get out of the weeds, have a meaningful discussion about student learning. I think how SLO finding this, I, in my mind, it's, it's all about how is it presented? How is mm. it framed? And, and is it framed in a way that's really impactful? I think, how does it help you tell the story? I think the data is always going to be the starting point of the conversation. But I feel that that when you utilize findings from assessments, and so how we've utilized findings from assessments, even in program review, we have the faculty reflect on the findings to show like, you know, like of the number of students who went through, what were the outcomes, so on and so forth, but primarily focused on what are you going to do? You know, what, and, and for some yeah, individuals, what I've heard, and like I said, I've worked with many colleges, well, 100% of our students are meeting the SLOs. I'm going to do nothing. Like, no, no. How are you going to continue to progress? How are you going to continue to share those practices? Because if we follow that same approach of, well, I'm not going to do anything different, we'd all still be on typewriters. And I think that'd be something that we have to kind of think about is how do you continue to bolster and move things forward? So just because you met a certain threshold doesn't mean you're done. And I think that's the starting point. And I think when, how the data may be presented is, wow, this program has 100% SLO completion, participation, all this great stuff. But what does that mean? And then when you look at, and when you look at SLOs, how does it reflect on this? So how does it reflect on maybe even the course success rates? And I know they're two different things, but if you have 100% completion of the SLOs, why are your success rates so low? Mm -hmm. Or vice versa? Vice shouldn't versa. they be um, similar enough in theory that if you're meeting the SLOs in theory, you should be passing or, or achieving your course? Right. And I, I think those are some questions that may come up with consistencies or inconsistencies. I think other areas where... And, and like I said, we make our SLO um, outcome data available publicly to everybody by course. So not by section, but by course in aggregate form, by modality, so on and so forth. And so you ask, like, how could the students utilize this? Well, it, it could be looked as almost as a twofold. So imagine if, if we went into your ESL class or, or a data science class to say, here's the outcomes that are occurring, you know, could a student then say, wow, it looks like students are learning in this class, in, in your class, or and maybe in Dr. Zentner's class, they're not learning anything because no one's meeting the outcomes. Could it be something utilized like a rate my professor? Potentially, if you could use it through that, like, wow, learning clearly doesn't occur in this class, but, and that's once again, an outside interpretation based on how is the data presented, you know? And without that dialogue, I think that's the key thing. And, and I think that's going to be really thinking about when looking at data and how we utilize that data, how do we help? And like I said, it's all about changing the narrative and helping the story and really focus on quality because that's my key things. It's not just what, what is it like, oh, what do you see in the findings? That's cool. But what are you going to do? And I think it's not even about what are you going to do is how, how are you going to facilitate that change? And I think something that that it, it leads into kind of the next question that you had, but but I'll I'll start it here is a lot of the times I've seen in the past, you know, we all assess all of our SLOs all the time. It's all great. But then what I've seen is some colleges like, we'll make a plan every term for every class and every SLO. So imagine an ESL. I'll use you for an example, you are because you're on my screen. So imagine if you had like 20 different ESL classes, 
three SLOs in each class. So you're talking about 60 plans done in one year. Is that feasible? Is that even mm. logical? It's not. Like I'll say it on a record line, that is not logical. And so, but how do you do that in a way where you can gather information over time and gather that, collect it, and then really make a, an informed change or a collective change based on some quality input across from students, faculty, and the like. And I think that's more of something that how can you use assessments in a meaningful way, as opposed to just, once again, get back to the box checking, everybody writes plans and 1% of the plans get done. I, I think that's some of the key aspects of what we really want to look at and how the data is being interpreted, you know. And like I said, if I'm using a true false to, to analyze my data and you're using like a comprehensive essay, is that something we can aggregate together? Probably not. But how do we talk about that? How do we demonstrate that? And I think that's really where the data can be leveraged. And then once again, the recommendations from others be aggregate in a way that really can inform the development of our courses, quality teaching and the like, and really emphasis on student learning. So that would be some of the recommendations I would see with assessments and how we've been used and, and some of the challenges that, that we face. So, so ultimately, again, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're talking here about the way to that students can actually take a look and, 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 and glean from, from the, 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 the data what it is that's happening to them, right? What it is that they are learning. I think that's, that's, that's a very, very important aspect of SLO discussion. Again, going back to your comments earlier about the, the idea that we are used to just checking off the boxes, making sure that, that, that it's a uh, compliance-driven effort and we are done. Instead, making it really a meaningful um, uh, tool to, again, articulate and make sure that students are the ones who know what it is that they are getting out of our institutions, out of our classrooms. So with, with that, um, I, I just would like to remind the audience, please don't hesitate to, to um, ask questions in the chat. And if you really wish to speak, um, we'll be happy to bring you on board and, 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 and let you articulate your thoughts. And um, Amanda, if you don't mind, would you please comment just, just briefly about the, uh, on, on the concept of the open pedagogy, how that relates to our discussion? Yep, absolutely. Um, one thing you had said, Aaron, um, about bringing students into that conversation on assessment, um, I'm a big advocate for open pedagogy, and that's co-constructing the knowledge or the assessment, whatever it might be that fits for your classroom with students. Um, and so open pedagogy is, is, is simply that for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's co-constructing with students mm -hmm. and it can be co-constructing the assessments that you're using, co-constructing the assessment means such as um, help me form the language that I'm going to be using in the rubric. So it's uh, applicable to you, it's accessible to you, it's inclusive of your lived experiences. Um, and so I just, everything you're saying is resonating so, so truly to that concept of bringing students into the conversation. It's be something we consistently do to them or at them, but something we do with them and finding the best way to how can I not only assess your knowledge, but support you in getting to that content learning, and you can be a partner with me in that content creation. So um, that, that's all that I was meaning for the, the open pedagogy. It's, it's just it's a fantastic um, application to everything you're saying. I think to build on kind of that thought is, is something we presented to researchers is really considering, as we, many of us know, there's something called the nine intelligences, or you can, can whittle it down to VARC, and how individuals learn. And I think looking at that, in, in a lot of times how we design our SLOs and our assessments, really thinking about the learning styles of individuals. And I the reason I mentioned that is we talked to researchers about, think about the learning styles of your audience in relation to data and information. How are you sharing that in a way where you're engaging that? And think about that with your students. Maybe not everyone's a test taker. Like, no one's a test taker. Like, how do you change that, you know, and really consider what different mechanisms could you use as opposed to that? And I think those are some, some key aspects as developing out. And like you said, really looking at that uh, open uh, pedagogy or and that approach, how do we leverage those expertise of the students to say, well, how can you learn? How can we teach this to you differently? You know, like, for example, in, in one of the classes I taught probability and we ended up, it was an in-person class. Everybody wrote something, some idea down on a paper ball, wrapped it up and threw it at me, the instructor. And what was the random probability that I would select what topic we would talk about? And really, really showing probability of that, you know, and saying, you know, out 30 pieces of paper, what's the random probability based on my distance to distance, how I would select that, right? 
And so really talking about the outside factors that would influence those things. And so really having a teaching and learning moment through more of an interactive that way, as opposed to me just talking. Right. So. Right. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Amanda, for bringing this up. That's that's a that's an important part of, of, of the discussion. Erin, thank you for the for the answer. Um, if we were to look at the um, going back to our accountability uh, discussion um, and, and, and really how to make it meaningful, what uh, what's the aspect of institutional effectiveness that uh, SLO assessment data would actually help? Um, address the issue of planning and accountability. Um, is, is SLO assessment data only for those purposes or, or, or how, how do you see this? Because there, there, there may be some ripple effect uh, that, that, that we are going to feel once we start paying attention to assessment of student learning and that becomes a thing we have to reckon with because of funding. Correct. I, I think it goes back to kind of our earlier conversation with accountability purpose. Like, yes, we all know, and many of our, our faculty contracts that we've, we've drawn up have the faculty have to report SLOs or assess their SLOs or whatever, based on whatever contracts are created. I think in, in the idea of accountability, I, I would say that it's strongly encouraged and, and it's how you approach that encouragement. I think is it, you know, the carrot, the stick, whatever it may be. Uh, for accountability, but accountability with purpose. Like, why right. am I doing this? And if you can start with that approach to let individuals know, here's what we're going to utilize this information for. It's kind of like you fill out a survey. You know, a lot of us don't want to do that. Like, it's annoying to fill out surveys. But if someone said, hey, we're going to utilize this for X, Y, and Z, you may have more of a feeling to actually participate in the survey or to do something of that magnitude. Similar with SLOs. And really shifting the accountability. And yes, I think really bring, here's why we want you to participate in SLO assessment and bring it back to that purpose. And just what I've seen, and once again, when we introduced our process of SLOs, we had like 30% of people participate, 30% of courses participate. And, you know, we had encouraging, it wasn't like, get this done. It was really encouraging. Here's why I really open forums for faculty to teach. And then really coaches focused in career education and then in individual general education to really engage with the faculty on that contextualized level of purpose, why, and, and the like. Really building that out over time and including the department chairs, mm. uh, creating almost a support system around SLOs and why we should do it, not because we have to, but what's the purpose of that was really impactful from what I've seen, not just at my institution, but at, at previous institutions and other institutions really bring that that culture around um, utilizing assessment for for positive improvement in relation to courses not in relation just to getting stuff I think that's that's the idea of we don't do this because we can get stuff I think right. that we can, we can't do that uh, we can't marry that out now utilizing SLO findings to identify opportunity for for resources and the like and I don't do resource allocation do more initiative allocation but for initiatives of change, I think that could be one key aspect of data that you could utilize to really mm -hmm. show, hey, in support of the direction we're planning to go as an institution, here's some showing where students could, their learning could be enhanced based on resource ABC, whatever it may be. And I think looking at it through that way with planning, but I think also in more of a localized planning is curricular planning, curriculum planning, as, as we have to go through per Title V, um, you know, regular curriculum updates. How do SLOs play in that role of curriculum update, you know, as far as content covered, material selected, things of that magnitude? Well, how does that really reflect in that? And I think the recording of that planning is the key aspect of accountability that we're looking for. And really, you know, for example, if we all win the lottery and leave, right, where's the plan in place to say that ESL is going to be updated at Santa Ana College, you know, from, from the department chair, like, you know, and, and all the great faculty there. So I think that's some of the questions of planning and how SLOs go into that. How do you create that meaningful plan for curricular development? What informs that other than, hey, what do you think we should do? I don't know. What do you think we should do? Check out this book that some random publisher sent me. Let's go beyond that to then actually doing, you know, based on the fines of SLOs, what do we need to more emphasize on? What are we trying to get the students to achieve? And really build in planning through that lens and really recording SLO findings and utilizing SLO practices in that mechanism. I think right. that would probably be the best approach. 
Absolutely, absolutely, fantastic. Thank you very much. This is this is very very insightful. Uh, again, inspirational even. Uh, uh, thank you, Aaron. So now uh, let me see here. I uh, since I have you here, I I, I really am very very um, uh, uh, curious about your work in the realm of of uh, artificial intelligence, as you as you mentioned earlier, and and I I would like you to 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 share with us how how do you see uh, AI tools can can possibly change the discussion that we are having about student learning, and then you know the impact of accountability. Let's not, let's not even touch that yet, because this is this is uh, as as you probably have experienced. Um, that's a phenomena artificial intelligence is that um, is really impacting us right now. It's not a science fiction story anymore. It's not something that's going to happen five, 10 years from now or whenever we get to it. It's something that has happened. And um, I tell you, yesterday I, I had a number of, of, of very, very interesting discussions uh, about the concept. And there are, there are people who are really panicking on one side of the spectrum, uh, trying to ban it, trying to figure out how to get rid of it and pretend that it doesn't exist. On the other side of the spectrum, we, we have those, those early adopters, so to speak, who are enthusiastically speaking about the idea without really understanding or knowing what to do with it. So if you could kind of like find a middle ground for us from your perspective, tell us again a little bit more about your work and what in the world is happening? What do we do now? I think that's that's a great question. I think, like I said, it's okay with anything new. It's it's scary. You know, you don't know what what it could be used for. And I think that that is one of the key aspects with artificial intelligence. And so, uh, I'll give you a story. Back in 2017, we wrote an IPI grant to explore augmented reality and artificial intelligence at Coastline. So about four or five years ago. We decided to say, how can we we explore this in, in the work we're doing? And so we've adopted a variety of things. I know many of our colleges have what they call a chat bot, which is, is it's almost like a micro chat GPT where you, you feed, feed it a knowledge base, someone asks questions and it can navigate them through. So I'll give that perspective and I'll give perspective in relation to learning. So for example, um, we have an artificial intelligence bot that many of your colleges have connects to your student information system. And so you can provide service 24 seven, you know, like if you go in, say, for example, if you went into your phone service or your internet provider and said, Hey, I need to reset my internet in the past, you'd have to talk to somebody like X, Y, and Z. You just verify your credentials. You go, you, you troubleshoot, you do that. The same thing can now happen in financial aid admissions and records. So you don't have to wait for nine to five to get your service. You can, and it, depending upon how smart your system is, you can upload your documents. It verifies that based on um, just, there's a variety of different things. I don't want to go into the technical aspects of that, but of, of how it brings your information in and it's, it's a one-stop shop. Yes, you'll need technical support when it gets a little bit more in detail, but how do you get more seamless services in a timely manner? And so, but in the area of, well, how can we use this in our classroom? And so I'll say it is a positive thing. I know it sounds scary, but legit, it's a positive thing. I had the opportunity to work with others and put together this uh, article about that, about what could that look like with AI? So think about an adaptive learning platform. So we all talk about creating a personalized experience, but is it? But what if you had a system like that could go into your canvas and based on, they used to have this called learning journey or uh, like learning mastery where you had different levels of learning. So say if Yark and I came in, he's a, he's really good at something and I'm just like super basic. Instead of us learning at the same trajectory rate, he may be given more advanced things that the system or the artificial intelligence can automatically feed over to him that would meet him where he is in his skill set, but then spend time with me in, in my skill set as I start developing it over time. So that's some of the adaptive systems that AI can use. Um, and that's what's like, that happens typically in training that ha that's already occurred in many things like with math, like you see this happening actually with some artificial intelligence and math learning where things, if you may not do well on something, it reinforces that. And it's based on a lot of, of skip logic and the like, but I think going a bit further as what we've seen through things such as um, in machine learning, where you have like, you know, everyone's like, oh, you need this service. Do I, do I need counseling? I don't know. Based on a variety of mm. behaviors, not just characteristics, but behaviors, factors, and the like, giving students what they need when they need it. Not having what we call as late alert, where you have to call somebody who then calls somebody and the student's already lost. That, that's not early alert, that's like late alert. Really thinking prior to, 
what can you project down the road with high accuracy to say, hey, Aaron Zettner may need counseling. Hey, Yarick may need tutoring. Let's get him that before this occurs. You know, let's introduce that instead of waiting for someone to be like, hey, I think you need tutoring. Hey, it's too late. I, I, and we're, now we're playing catch up. I think other areas where you utilize speech recognition, and then as we talk about meeting students where they are, having things based on people's speech patterns, how they talk to engage and react with them. I know there's a lot of colleges' websites actually that are emerging this way based on your preferences in this. It'll show you information in a way that you prefer seeing it based on as they've tracked you over time and your IP address and the like. So you and I may be going to a different website or say even a different LMS. And we may be in the same place at the same time, but based on our information consumption behavior, it will reshape to meet us where we are. I think those are some of the things that, that things can utilize our behaviors and our actions and react in that thing. I, I think some other things that um, people have used in, in my classes is like with text analysis, where you take volumes and volumes and volumes of information. You dump it into these systems and it'll summarize it for you. An easier way to consume information. So imagine being like, hey, read these 800 chapters or read this summary. Where are you going to really get the majority of the learning in 800 chapters? We remember like 2% of it or in that summarized information. That's where AI can really go into that. And I think that's some of the areas where it's a very brief snapshot on how AI can be utilized. I think also when when others have looked at that, and, and if you look at ChatGPT, like currently what it is, it doesn't comb the internet. It comes a huge database of text, libraries, books, information that's been scraped from the internet that's been modeled based on about a billion, 3.5 what billion points. 4.0 is coming out, and it, I believe what I've read online a few times, it's a trillion points. So what we're looking at now is super basic and compared to what's coming in the next few months. Right. And so I think looking at that and how do we leverage that in the student's research. And it's really, there's even courses online right now about how to ask the right question of AI. And I think that's really like, so for example, when you're writing your lecture, like I'll actually give an example that, that my friend used. And he said, how to explain, and this is, this is an administrator, how to explain full-time equivalent students to a six-year-old. Right. So he wrote that. And then it gave him an answer and he sent it to his deans <laughs> and they loved it. They're like, this is great. We totally understand this. I think those are the types of things on how do you leverage AI when you can be like, you know, let's talk about quantum physics right. and write it in a way of saying, how do you explain this in a, in a palatable manner? It can take that and help even strengthen your lecture beyond the capabilities by which you may have, you know, now currently in this current state, I wouldn't use the citation part of it, but as it develops over time, the, the AI systems, you'll be able to utilize that to really build out learning. And I think about that with a primarily SLO assessment, what would be the best type of assessments to, to get to this outcome? What would you recommend? And like I said, beyond our expertise, it was interesting because I asked, actually asked it the other day to write a diversity statement. I sent it to my friends and they're like, this is the best I've ever read. Where'd you get this? Chat GPT. And they're like, well, we can't use this. And I was like, why not? What's the difference between that and a consultant? Mm. and there was no answer right and so right. thinking about that how can we leverage ai as a tool and i know individuals are going to be like well students could cheat well guess what they could cheat before chat gbt too so i think that's something that we need to recognize to say well how do we leverage that in a way and in in the in the magnitude where we can get the the best almost um approach to that because people are going to be using this this tool in their jobs. People are going to be using this tool to create content. If it's becoming some type of a standardized thing, how do we leverage that? So I, I think that's that's something that and, and I like what Enrique you put in there in the in the chat. I think that's a really key aspect of things is, you know, are we teaching people how to utilize, get information and, and learn something? Or are we teaching them to get the grade? I, I think, how do we leverage AI as a tool to do that? And like I said, there's, there could be good uses of it. There could be bad uses of it. People have written it to create malware and viruses. Yes. You know, others have, have said, hey, look at this data and give me the result. Okay. That's awesome. But I, I think those are the types of things of understanding the strengths and weaknesses of, of utilizing that would be the key aspect. And how do we frame that use? And Almost, I would recommend, how do you incorporate it if you can into your courses 
to let the students know that you are aware of this and and so and to reinforce it as a positive but not as something like you can't use this or get get an f in my class i don't know so i think that's just something that i would really look at there's so many capabilities that it has and just like i said in this thing we put together i had like i don't know 20 different recommendations how you can use it in higher ed and that's just the 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 tip of, of the iceberg on that sure so. sure 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 uh, so, so, so again, uh, I had a number of, con of conversations yesterday during the first day of the symposium on, on 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 this topic, and and obviously you're painting a very complex yet very promising future, so to speak. Uh, but I tell you, there are there are colleges, there are institutions, there are there are faculty members who would like to have the thing banned and and dismantled to the extent that's possible. And and uh, one of those one of the reasons for that is is really the, the the fear that the intelligence can create, as you mentioned, bad things. Now, counter to that, I, I I've seen a brilliant comment. I thought uh, that if artificial intelligence is meant to harm, then it's not intelligent. And I think that's something for us to 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 ponder. But as we go back to our our campuses and and conversations with uh, faculty and and uh, faculty leaders, um, what what would be a tagline or, or or a thought that we could share to convey the message? Then you know, guess what? M future is here. We need to learn how to take advantage of it of it rather than try to deny that it exists. I think that's that's a really good point is recognizing the realities by which we're living in because artificial intelligence, like you said, it's it's already been here. It's just now it's more mainstream. And, and I think it's it's just going to continue to find its way in there. It's just how in my biggest question is how do you verify um, this information, false information from real information? You know, because as we start creating content between with these tools, to ensuring that um, how is the information that's being disseminated accurate, you know, and I think those are some key aspects of that. I think there's a lot of tools with this where you can verify the information, but I think that's, that's a key point is how, how do we do this as a positive or a harm? And it's just like SLOs. Yeah, I think that SLOs is a prime example. Remember when it first came out, I hate SLOs. I think everybody said that for like quite some time. And I, I think, how do you, change that to a positive perspective how do we look at the positives of it and how we can leverage the strengths of it to really you know enhance the learning experience because i think that's the key aspect is how do you use it to enhance the work we do and and also into our students and how they can use it because like i said if this is here to stay which it probably is if anybody's ever driven a car that, that self-drives or, or recognizes or has a camera that can notice things or even on your phone all that stuff's powered by machine learning, AI, things of that magnitude. Like, I don't think that's going to go away. And so I, I think, how do we live with this as something as a positive and frame it that way? Yes, we can focus on the negative all day. It's easy. It's fun. But I think that the idea is how do we make that something that creates that positive content? And and like I said, could it be something that could be used in a, in a negative way? Then yes. And like, well, they could cheat on my test. Well, change your test change the way you're doing it then i think that's that's the question really rethink what you're doing so absolutely yes that's no 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 wonder that there is so much concern consternation among faculty and and it really there isn't a discipline that's not impacted by this be, mainly because uh we use writing as a as a way to assess what it is that students know on any topics with you know from 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 biology to english obviously so there is there is um always some kind of a homework that requires reflection and then let alone the fact that that chat gpt can 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 write computers uh, co computer code it can uh write songs it can kind of uh, write poems so there's really a number of things that 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 um let on research papers, right, or, or, or program review documents. <laughs> it's true. So, yeah, all well, there. Yeah, and I would just, I would just recommend this as for faculty to to do some research on 
on what it has been already been used for, like as far as creating content, writing lyrics, like not just chat GPT, but AI in general, there's so many other AIs that, that come into place. Like there's this one really cool one where you can actually make art based on you list a couple things that you want the art piece, and then it curates that art for you. It's actually pretty neat. And so, um, so I think those are some of the things that how do, do we create something different from that and why? So now, Aaron, if I could uh, follow up on, 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 on that thought, uh, see, once I ask an AI tool to create a picture for me, how am I as a viewer going to know that that picture is any good? In a sense that if I don't have enough exposure to the world of art, looking at other pictures, to have this judgment in my brain that this is a good picture and this is just not so well done picture, how am I going to know the difference if AI spits out what I ask it to do? You know, I think it's a really good point because I think especially with something so subjective as art that that I think when you say to something, hey, do this, it may put together something based on its repository of information, but it's not the picture you see in your head. I don't think we're there yet. Now, you could probably put detail to say like, hey, build a giraffe with with a three foot long neck staying next to a seven foot uh, um I don't know, bear, blah, 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 blah. And it can put that together. But like I said, we talk about what do you ask the AI to do? Right. It, it answers the question on what you have ask it to do. So given the detail and the, and the aspect and the parameters is what we'll say that you give it, will then uh, output what you want. So it really makes us to think critically of saying, how do we clearly articulate ourselves or describe the things that we're looking to get? Because, you know, it's like, hey, summarize SLOs. What does that mean, Right. But, you know, can you summarize how students learn in this atmosphere during this point in time with blah, 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 blah. You may get a different answer. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, I used an example of a picture because you, you, you mentioned it, but that obviously, again, applies to English, right? How do I know that this essay is a good one versus the other one? Poetry, you know, pretty much anything in that, that you're doing writing. As a, as, a, um, as a student or as a faculty, as a, as a person who requests AI to, 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 to do something, I have to have a good understanding of what would be an acceptable answer for me. Um, and, and that's the part that I, that I think that's where the faculty role, that's where the faculty role comes in, right? To provide this nurturing environment rich with examples critical thinking analysis, uh, solving problems that will really put students in a position that they will be informed um, consumers of this, of this, of this vast uh, fountain of knowledge, for lack of a better expression. I think it's really interesting what you bring up, and I know we're, we're going all over the place with this, but it, it almost makes me think of a really cool assignment that if you made for your students to what question would you ask ChatGPT and what's the answer you would get if you asked AI something, what would it be to really help hone in on those skills of how to be really clear and to the point and articulate to really get to the answer? Because that's something they're going to learn and utilize in some, some time in their life. Will it, will it be working with Siri on their phone, AI or chatbot, whatever it would be? How do you do that? And then what result would they get? And then teaching them how to refine that. It's almost like when we write our dissertations. Like, you know, you start with like a broad question that you find, refine, refine, refine down. How do you do that with, with students? And that's maybe a skill that you could teach over time. I think that's, that would be a pretty fun one. It'd be a really fun activity. But, but two, I think you, you're right. Uh, with giving the expertise to the faculty member to say, you know, based on the level and the context and level of expectation, how do you frame that? Because if you're like, hey, write this essay, is it a good essay? according to who and according to what, based on what context and what point in time. I, I think maybe with this next version of, of chat GPT-4, you could put that in there, given the parameters you set. But I really think it brings down to the, to the human perspective, as you say, given what your expect, level of expectation would be. 
And, and, and I tell you, the reason I ask this, because to me, outcome, skill, as, as Enrique keeps putting in the, in the chat there, skill and competency really is what matters in a sense that, that, that again, to create something with AI, I have to have enough understanding, knowledge, and really skill to ask the question, to interpret it, and use it for the, for the benefit that I that I needed needed. So that's that's the context of the discussion. And that's how I see that, you know, again, some some of the uh people who are who are so concerned about the role, diminishing role of faculty, those those I think um uh, thoughts could be put to rest at least for now until we you know perhaps come up with 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 even higher higher level of AI that's going to really replace human beings as we as we as we know them, which is I guess that's that's possible too. I mean, you know, hey, guess what? It's an avatar that's speaking to you, you know, in my voice. It's not really me, it's just my AI <laughs> image here. Who knows? Those 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 things are 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 quite possible in 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 uh in the next next, you know, seemingly, you know, sooner than later, <laughs> all of a sudden, right? It seems. But but uh, that's that's my point. That that's I'm 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 trying trying to to uh, bringing down to the fact that that skill and competency is still what's going to drive us. You know, the six-year-old will always be a six-year-old, and then a uh, 19-year-old will always be a 19-year-old, and then you know, someone with with postgraduate education is going to be yet another set of skills and competencies and expectations as to what to do with the with the tool that's available. I, I think you bring up a good point, and I know we're we're reaching time, but. There was this tool we used for a while, for about two years, and it was a place where taught students how to not just interview, but we demonstrated it for um, communication studies, and it, it was an AI. It was an AI where you set the parameters of the AI, but it would use what you call computer visioning. And so computer visioning is basically, there's a variety of ways to explain it, but basically it's, it's watching behavior, kind of like how your car can identify what things are. But it watched you as you interviewed. And so if you were like this, or you're like this, you're moving around, you're looking around the screen, it could watch that behavior. But then it also listened to how you were answering the questions. And based on the contextual feedback that the faculty created for it, it could give you feedback to say, was the tone there? Was your speech speaking too fast? And you were talking too, it looked like someone, but it wasn't, it was an avatar at that point. But we've seen this with some of the stuff we've explored with competency-based education was where it's an interactive and you're interacting with a bot. There's like no one there, but you're talking to them and based on your feedback and how you're engaging with that individual, are you demonstrating these, what they used to call, they call them critical skills now, but soft skills with the individual but there is no individual it's it's right. a robot but it's and i don't think at this other thing is looking at how you're you're moving like this other system we used but it really gives you feedback to be like hey your um what do you say nonverbal communication is this this and this mm. and it can help you build on those skills you know like hey you turn your head too much this time Aaron, or hey you're moving your hands around too much it's very distracting so we give you feedback that way or, or you can even say, you know, you say what they call fillers. You do a lot of ums, Aaron, like um, this, um, that. And, right. and you do that to really correct on those. And so those are where you can leverage AI in a more advanced technique where, like you said, you could be potentially talking to a bot, but you're building your competencies and skills based on that interaction that can occur, like I said, 24-7. We're not waiting on like a, a nine to five schedule. And I think those are some learning things where AI can be embedded into the work we're doing. So it's pretty neat. Yes, yes. I think that the point that, that, that you mentioned is, you, you remember the uh, movie Matrix, right? When, when Trinity and Neo have to fly a helicopter and they don't know how to do it. So they contact their programmer, right? Who uploads the uh, ability to fly a helicopter to Trinity's brain. She gets in and, and they are successful doing this. So that's where we are. That's where we are. Erin, thank you so much. Uh, we are we are just so grateful for your time and expertise. Uh, any any last minute? I still would like to make sure we have uh, three four minutes for a break. But if there are any burning questions, anyone, please don't hesitate to um, to speak. If you have anything else to to add to the discussion, 
Other than that, Aaron, always a pleasure. We'll stay always in touch. Fun. Looking forward to the uh, uh, data and donuts number three. And you are always welcome to stop by during one of our Friday talks. And, and, and the discussion is to be continued. Really appreciate your presence here today. Excellent. Great. It's great having you here. And always good seeing you and seeing everybody. Thanks again. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll take a five-minute break. Uh, the next uh, talk starts at uh, 10 o'clock. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning again. Uh, this is uh, speaker number three for this morning's uh, agenda. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Catherine Webb, uh, Vice President for Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges, Western Association of Schools and Colleges. Um, with her presence here, uh, there are two moderators, Alicia Betancourt from San Diego City College and Bethany Tasaka, San Bernardino Valley College. Uh, Catherine, great pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Alicia and Bethany, please. I think we're getting all of our pins on the page. Right. Yeah, thank you. Unmuting, right? <laughs> Is Alicia here? Yes. Uh, yes, you should be. Yes, you should be. But Bethany, you can just, just start us off. Um, okay, I didn't Say get hello. your bio. I'm so sorry. No problem at all. I didn't no. get your bio, Catherine. That's this okay. Is, um, it's, I'm it's sorry, it's me... Saturday morning. No, no, it is. no problem at all. Um, That's okay. My bio is the the it... less important thing about today's topic. So, if we good morning, everyone. Bio... I actually I actually do have your bio, Catherine. I'm oh. so sorry. It's I'm okay. Having trouble really, with my really okay. Mute button. <laughs> okay. Um, so good morning, um, Dr. Webb. Um, I have really enjoyed the times that you've been present at our Friday Slow Talks. And um, she is, um, she has over two decades of building relationships, which seems to be um, what her major focus is, is building relationships and equitable achievement um, in students and faculty. Um, she works with private and public um, institutes and she is part of the accreditation um, committee, um, which San Diego City College is under that process right now. Um, but she has held um, faculty positions and administrative system positions across the community college system in California. Um, so we are very excited to hear um, the updates about accreditation and standards that Dr. Webb has to um, present to us today. Thank you so much, Alicia and, and Bethany and Yarek. Um, I'm just going to echo what um, Dr. Lowe said this morning at the eight o'clock session. You know, when Yarek reaches out and says, come speak to us, I always want to say, yes, thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be a, a, a supporter of this, this SLO symposium and the SLO work that you're all doing. Um, thank it's you. It's very thank meaningful you. work. So happy, happy, happy to be here. Um, so in terms of updates from ACCJC, a couple of things and um, that I'll talk about while I'm bringing up, I have just a couple of slides that I want to talk through. Um, certainly the biggest update um, is that we're focused on reviewing our standards and revising our standards. There are a couple of other things that we're working on. Some of you may have had the opportunity to meet our new president, Mac Powell. He's in, uh, he started in um, July. And if you haven't had a, a chance to meet him, really take advantage of that opportunity. He's very student focused. He's, um, he's got a lot of national level accreditation experience, which is informing the way that we implement and improve our own internal processes. So with that, I hope you can all see my slides. Um, I have just a couple of things that I wanna talk about, mostly focused on the standards review. Um, but I also kind of want to touch back on, on a, some things that Dr. Lowe said this morning in her talk about the way that the chancellor's office is evolving. And I was struck as I, um, particularly she talked about uh, the from two slides, um, you know, the two moving towards this idea of the right to succeed 
Um, and then that from access to outcomes, from completion as success to high wage jobs and transformed lives as success. Um, I, there's some nice synchronicity here because that's really been a focus of ACCJC's conversations internally about how we take the next step with our standards and the processes and practices that we're implementing. Um, so yeah, I thought that was, that was fantastic. You saw um, her talking about a shift towards love and belonging, towards student-centeredness, towards this idea of how does the institution design its, its environment so that we're taking responsibility for the student's success? Um, you'll see those things, I hope, echoed in the, the draft of the new standards. Okay. So when we started our, um, our conversations about what do we want our new standards to be, um, you know, we wanted to have a very inclusive process from the outset. We wanted people to have some input into uh, where we went rather than just giving folks something to um, react to. So we asked, we brought a big group of people together and we asked them this question, you know, in one, one to three words, what is your hope for the new standards? What do you hope that the new standards will be? And you can see the word cloud that, um, that folks developed uh, in response to that question. Um, you know, uh, clear, concise, streamlined, certainly. So there were some process pieces and some structural pieces, but also look at some of those other words, inspiring, equity, student-centered, higher level, meaningful, simplified, but thorough. So, you know, I, I think um, while wanting to maybe have clarity around what the standards were asking people to do, there was no suggestion that the level of accountability in the standards be, be um, diminished. Uh, and when the questions that you were talking with Dr. Zentner about around accountability, it struck me that the question is not, we're gonna let go of accountability. The question is reframing to who is that accountability to? Um, and there's a way when you're doing outcomes assessment work, I think, to say, well, yeah, we do assessment of outcomes because ACCJC says we have to, it's in the standards. We're accountable to ACCJC. That expectation is in the standards, that's true. But I think at a deeper level, we're all accountable to our students, to our community. And so if you're doing the accountability and framing the accountability as we're doing it because it's the right thing to do for our students, because it helps us be accountable to what we tell our students we're gonna do, um, to the mission that we have to serve them. The, the piece of accountability that is accountability to the accreditors takes care of itself. Um, and so you'll see some of that framing, I hope, embedded in the draft standards when you look at them. Um, okay, so that's what we hoped they would be. In addition to that, there's this framework for reflection and improvement that we wanted to make sure that was embedded. So when you've been talking about how you do assessment practices with your faculty and um, others on your campus, um, or how you do it at an institutional level, or really even when you're approaching your um, institutional self-evaluation work, that, that ICER work that you do, four basic questions. What did you do? Why did you do it? What were the results? And what did you learn from it? So that you can, again, take that, that learning forward, try something different. What was the different thing that you did? Why did you do it? What were the results? What did you learn? And you're spiraling, instead of closing the loop, you're really spiraling that loop forward in time so that that's helping you respond and adapt and be nimble as the students that you serve, as their needs change, because their needs are changing all the time. The students are changing all the time. And so this is really, um, again, in the, in the standards, the, the idea is that that cycle of um, spiraling forward is, is kind of baked in. Um, and if you're doing the reflective work for outcomes assessment, these are questions that you may be asking people to reflect on anyway in your, in your local practices. 
In addition, there's some foundational elements in the standards that, that you'll see. Certainly, um, we want to keep you all in line with uh, U.S. Department of Education requirements and regulations, so they're in line with the federal requirements. They're in line with other current norms and practices within U.S. higher education broadly, including um, the way that our partner agency standards are continuing to evolve. Um, and they're based on the commission's eligibility requirements, which are not changing, as well as the commission's policies and uh, values. And then for the whole process of drafting and um, uh, building the draft, we, everybody that was involved, and I'll talk about that in a minute because it was a very, it continues to be a very inclusive process, everybody was leaning into these same guiding principles, regardless of what role they had in um, developing the draft. Everybody was focused on outcomes, and I mean outcomes broadly, so results, not um, necessarily student learning outcomes, although that's certainly part of it, but outcomes and improvement rather than the process that got you to the, the outcome. So, you know, and I say this those of you who have heard me do an ICER training have, have probably heard this metaphor, but you can have the most beautiful assessment process or program review process on paper, but if it doesn't lead to any data that you can use to inform your processes, if you don't have documentation of the results um, that are meaningful in a way that can help you determine whether or not you're making gains, equitable gains for your students, I would ask whether or not that process is good whether that's a useful process for you. So focus on outcomes and improvement rather than on the process that gets you there. We really wanted standards that were reflective of the diversity of ACCJC member institutions. You know, Alicia mentioned our membership includes private institutions, um, faith-based institutions, institutions in Hawaii and the Western Pacific who are organized very differently. Um, we have some candidate institutions from the East Coast. So again, really different uh, cultures and practices and regulations at the state level. We wanted these standards to be applicable in all of those settings. Um, we wanted to use clear language and minimize um, redundancy between the standards. So it was a little easier to do the self-reflection um, we wanted to balance that idea of accountability and accountability for whom or to whom um, with the idea of ongoing learning and improvement. And because we recognize that the best learning sometimes happens when you try something and it doesn't work. That question of what did you learn? You learned, okay, we're never going to do that again. We tried it and it didn't work. So we're going to have to do something differently or it worked differently than we anticipated. Um, we wanted to make sure that that balance between, yeah, we're holding ourselves accountable, accountable uh, for high, high quality standards, but also we're recognizing that perfection is not possible. Improvement is the goal. So how are you balancing those two things? And then really um, fundamentally emphasizing em equity and inclusion, not just this question of, of um, are your outcomes equitable, but the idea of, are you inclusive? Um, do your students, as they're coming to your college, do they see themselves here? How do you build an environment that's inclusive and um, learner-centered um, as you, uh, that piece of love and belonging that uh, Dr. Lowe mentioned? That's really, really important, as we know, for engagement and retention. So all of that was developed um, in this, uh, it's been a big process. It's been a two year process at this point, but we had a lot of people, many hands in, um, in developing this draft. Um, there are five teams that were working on drafting, uh, big content areas, um, not necessarily teams that were tied to each individual standard. We broke the standards apart and said, we're gonna blow the whole structure up. We just know we wanna talk about mission. We wanna talk about academic, uh, quality. We want to talk about um, supports, learning supports and student services. We want to talk about quality there. We want to talk about structure. Uh, and we want to talk about relationships and decision making within the college. Um, here's your content topics. Go. Go talk about these things. So we had people doing some writing. 
Then we had some people coming back and doing some reflection and some stress testing and usability testing, offering some further refinements. Um, and then we have a leadership team that is still uh, working as suggestions and further refinements come in from the field, talking about going back to those principles, saying, how do we incorporate these suggestions into the draft to make it, um, again, uh, uh, can we incorporate those, those suggestions that we're getting in a way that stays true to those overarching guiding principles? And then the commission will take action on the final um, draft that comes from the leadership team up in, uh, in June. Um, in terms of the timeline, I mentioned it's been two year process. Um, we are really at the point now where the first draft went out to the field um, in fall of 2022. We made some adjustments. We sent out another draft based on some feedback. And then we sent out a third draft based on the, the feedback we were getting from the, uh, the rest of the fall semester right before we went to the commission meeting, meeting in January. Um, we're going to do another round of dialogue and input um, throughout the spring. There are some town, virtual town halls scheduled um, in February and in April. Our comment form remains open. We really want feedback from the field, both things that you like and things that you still need clarity on. So it's um, really important. I'll have a link to the form in a minute. Um, and then we anticipate that uh, if all goes well, the commission will do a second reading and adoption of the standards in June, which means that the, um, the, accredit the ACCJC staff are right now thinking about what implementation means and what that looks like, because this will be radically different um, in the way that you write your ICER, in the way that you structure your ICER. The questions are very different. So. Um, a little bit about the, the dialogue that we've had so far. We had seven uh, town halls that ACCJC hosted. Three of them were in person and four of them were virtual. And then we had some, um, we were invited to do some discussions uh, with our partners out in the field. So including the um, Academic Senate for California Community Colleges and the RP group. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of hard to get a nose count of how many people attended because some people went to more than one session. But we are thinking that at least 275 people attended one of those sessions, at least one of those sessions. And there was great dialogue at those sessions. Um, the, the point was for us to listen to the people who were there and take the notes and take them back. Um, and then there were an additional 52 unique comments that came through. Uh, our web form. Um, and we made some high level changes to that draft as it went into the first reading at the commission um, based on the feedback that we were getting from the field. So you can see those changes if you want. You can go to the, um, to the website. You'll see a red line version, it's called. You can see how, how the draft has evolved from the first draft that came out in, I think, late August to the draft that then ended up in front of the commission in December. So you can kind of track how things have been evolving. And then they, uh, Susie has already put this in the chat for us. This is great. If you go to the standards review website, um, you will see, scroll down a little bit, you'll see a big red button that says standards review comment form. That's where you can enter your additional comments. You'll also see links to the current draft that uh, we'd like to discuss with you. Uh, that came out of that commission meeting. Um, yeah, so that's that's where you want to go um, for for comments. We we really do want to hear from you. And then again, next steps. The commission has accepted the first draft. They they did that in January. We'll do the the listening sessions as I mentioned. The standards review leadership team sometime after that uh, final day of um, listening sessions will incorporate. The feedback, um, integrate that in a way that is aligned with those uh, high-level principles I shared with you. Um, and then we would anticipate that adoption at the, the June commission meeting. Um, so I'm hoping that you've had a chance to look at the draft standards. And um, as I, I kind of alluded to this before um, yesterday, but there are some really big changes structurally. Um, 
they're designed to be more student centered and more holistic around uh, the idea of how your student you're supporting your students. They're designed to facilitate conversation across the institution rather than within silos. So everybody has a, a role in supporting the students' ultimate success um, at the institution and whatever their next step is. But how do you work together so that you see how those pieces are interconnected? Um, so if you look at the version of the draft standards that includes the review criteria and possible sources of evidence, what you'll see is that outcomes assessment data, um, whether we're talking about pro PLOs or SLOs or um, you know, ILOs or administrative um, outcomes, if your institution has those, they're sprinkled throughout all four standards. So it's really taking those, those assessment data and making them the foundation of your, of your um, allowing you to show how they are the foundation of the work that you're doing, how they're informing the work that you're doing. Uh, just coming back to that idea of equity that Dr. Lowe shared earlier this morning, you know, and I may not get this quote right exactly, but she said at, at its heart, it's about knowing what your students need and then organizing yourselves to meet those needs. Outcomes assessment data, that's certainly one way that you do that. Um, it's not the only way. There's student achievement data, but you know, they work, you work together. You use those data together to inform the work that you're doing. Um, and as we move towards um, credit for prior learning models and, and things of that sort, um, I think those outcomes data, the outcomes information, the assessment data, and more and more critical to understanding how, how well you're meeting what your students need you to meet, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. So with that, I'm going to stop. Um, I have the standards on another screen here. If we need to look at something specific, I'm happy to bring them up and share the screen, but I'm going to stop and so that we have more time for your questions. I have a question for you, Dr. Webb. Um, how do these new standards um, align and support our CBE efforts? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So um, there are many places where, you know, in the, the current standards are very prescriptive and they say, you know, the institution is doing assessment of course learning outcomes, program learning outcomes, general education learning outcomes, and, you know, there's SLOs, CSLOs, PLOs, ILOs, GELOs, um, which always makes me hungry for some reason. I don't know why, uh, but jealous. Um, these standards are much more agnostic. They're saying you're using assessment data. You're assessing the things that you offer. And if you have a program or a certificate that includes a component of credit for prior learning or CBE, um, the expectation is, well, you're doing some kind of assessment work to make sure that the students can demonstrate or have, have mastered or are working towards mastery of the outcomes that you've set for them. Um, so the data is included as um, kind of how do you know that what you're doing is working? And that's listed as possible sources of evidence that you could use to show those standards. So the standards are really more about the concepts and the practices um, rather than the process. And because they're not so much about the process, the standard can be, uh, you know, you're setting your, this is not a standard, but I'm kind of uh, summarizing. You're setting your students up for uh, their next step. Um, you have programs that are uh, relevant to industry in your region, um, and you're preparing your students to meet those needs whether it's transfer or work related. How you do that then is up to you. If you do it through CBE, great. If you do it through a traditional on-ground program, great. If you do it through a hybrid program, great. Because you know our institutions are very, very different in how they structure themselves. Um, to be inclusive of the whole membership, we need to have standards that are flexible enough to let the institution say, no, trust us, this is how we do it. It's really high quality, this is how we know. 
our students are getting what they need. They're taking away the skills and competences, competencies that they need. This is how we know. Rather than us saying, thou shalt assess outcomes at this level, this level, this level, this level, and oh, what, you're, you're now um, implementing med meta majors or career pathways? You need to have outcomes for your meta majors too. No, it's, it's about saying, okay, you're, that higher level principle of are your students learning what they need to learn? And then how do you know? Show us. Um, I have another question that popped up in the chat um, and it came from Rebecca. She was asking about the historical um, standards and how there's a consistent emphasis on um, student learning outcomes, um, but there's also always resistance to student learning outcomes assessment. Um, many claim it's just a trend in education that's going to pass, but the ACC-JC seems to be doubling down on that. So why is ACC-JC focusing so many standards on this one tool and why does that work? Yeah, um, well, why does it work? I don't know that it does um, to focus all the standards on that one tool. And that's why in the draft standards, um, there are not as many standards specifically that they that say thou shalt do assessment of learning outcomes. There are more standards that say, you need to know what your students need. It needs to be reflected in your curriculum and communicated to your students and you need to assess it. How do you know? There are more standards that say, you know, there's, there's this, um, Back to that principle of you're meeting your students' needs and what is the data that uh, shows you that you're doing that. The expectation is you might have SLO data that shows you that. You might have PLO data that shows you that. You might have survey data that shows you that. You know, um, So there are fewer standards that are specifically calling out and saying you have to do assessment in, you know, write about your assessment in standard 1B, standard 1B7, standard 1B9, and then 2A3 and 2A14 and, and all of the others. It's really more holistic in that way. Um, the expectation that you're doing assessment is absolutely still there, but being um, less prescriptive about the specific levels where it's happening. Because again, how do you know that what you're doing is working? Um, if you think about um, what we were saying about setting up the, the learning environment for your students to be successful, I have always thought that PLOs are one of the best tools for communicating and helping motivate your students towards whatever their next step after, um, after they leave you is, whether that's transfer or whether that's, um, whether that's a work, you know, a work entry into the workforce. You're telling them, here are the marketable skills you're gonna be taking with you. This is almost, it's almost like you're promising them if you do your part as a student and you come in and you're, you're, you're working towards this, this is what we're gonna give you. You're gonna be able to take these skills with you and apply them whatever, whatever comes next. So my feeling is if you're really designing a, uh, an institutional structure that is student ready, the the outcomes learning outcomes are your best friend they're they're a really great tool and it comes back to that rubric uh, or the assessment and how do you involve students in the assessment you can come back to that and say okay so you're in this pathway you know that at the end of the pathway here's kind of what you're working towards in the this course here's the piece of that that we're going to talk about here's how we're going to get you there here's how um here are the, the, the ways you're going to demonstrate that, you know. I, so I think, again, it's not so much that um, the standards as they are written now, um, I think, are designed to say, well, if we don't tell them to do this, they won't do it. But I think uh, there was a question that, that I heard yesterday or that maybe it was on the list of questions that uh, they sent the panel yesterday that we didn't get to about, you know, how do you talk to faculty who may be resisting collecting outcomes data? You know, what would you say? And I, I had an answer ready for that. You better believe it. Um, and my answer was absolutely do not tell them 
do not start the conversation with ACCJC says you have to, or do it because it's required by education. You know, the, the right way to do that is to say, why is assessment a good practice for students? How, if we do assessment well, how does that help our students? How does that help us serve our students? And it's maybe that what that ends up meaning, you know, if you start to dive into that, why I don't want to, uh, you know, as a faculty, I'm resisting this. Maybe it's because the way that you've designed the system for collecting data isn't meaningful. It doesn't really go back to those four questions that we talked about. Um, you know, there can be a lot of reasons why people don't want to do it. Um, but I think you start by diving into the, the, the reasons for the resistance with the understanding that at the end of the day, nationally, broadly speaking, lots of higher education experts for a long time have said, assessing your learning outcomes is a good way to help your students. It's a good thing to do. It's a good thing. It helps you serve them better. So if you start from a place of agreement on we're all here to serve our students better, then you can open up that conversation. It becomes less about the tool, to come back to Rebecca's question, it becomes less about the tool and more about the why, the purpose. So Rebecca, I hope I answered that for you. So I have I've a bit of a parallel question um, that may not be the most eloquently compo composed, but um, you know, as we kind of think about these new standards and how ACC JC is really approaching them, um, I come back to the piece you talked about about equity and and making sure that our outcomes are inclusive and represent equitable practices. But I don't know, I guess the cynic in me, right? I I I, I kind of go back to this place of it it forces our campuses to feel like they have to put it in a mission statement. They have to write, you know, anti-racist in um, our values or our visions or something, you know, things like that. And so how how is ACCJC really encouraging campuses to be authentic with where they are on that, you know, DEIAA journey and to really um again authentically integrate those practices into who they are and what they do as opposed to just it's there because if if we don't put it there ACCJC will be mad at us you know what I mean like what's that balance and how do we take that back to our campuses because I think that's kind of where we are in a lot of our campuses now right it's um they're turning into buzzwords they're turning into trendy you know and 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 we want it to be authentic because that's what's good for our students. And I don't know that there's an exact question in there, so I hope you can pick. No, um, out of course. Of that. No, I really, I really appreciate that. And um, you know, what I hear you asking about is what um, uh, what I've heard called steps beyond statements, um, and that's coming from you know there was a there's an um, a industry leader or a higher education leader in uh, the Midwest. He's currently at um, Tri-C, which is Cuyahoga Community College in Cleveland. And he talks about steps beyond the statement. So you have a statement, but what does that mean? Your work is not done there. You have to keep stepping forward and you have to live. You have to live. People are not gonna, they don't listen to what you say. They see what you do, you know? So I take your, I take your meaning very, very, um, the heart of that question, you know, in the days where ACCJC was thinking or where it was perceived as like, well, if we don't have every single thing that's listed in the standard in this laundry list related to our mission statement, if it's not there in our mission statement, we're going to get dinged, whatever that means, dinged. Um, and I think, you know, ACCJ, part of the answer to your question is that ACCJC's paradigm for working with its colleges is really now to trust you. You are accredited. You are an accredited institution, which means that you met these standards. You may have areas where you can work. Um, just because you're meeting the standard does not also mean that you don't have room for improvement or that there aren't places where you're gonna continue to grow um, in the, through the life of your institution. 
Um, but if we start by saying, we trust you, we trust you, that I think lets you say, okay, let's, let's take a deep breath and um, go back and say, what is our mission really? And yeah, it's in the mission statement, but how do we live that? And where is the data? Uh, where's the data that shows that? Okay. The other thing I want to touch on um, that I think you're kind of hinting at, and I think the easiest way to do this, and so I apologize, I'm going to, I apologize to Susie in the background, I'm going to share my screen because I want to, I want you to see the, for those of you who haven't looked at it yet, the very first standard um, in the draft. Okay. Okay, so this very first standard, standard 1.1, the institution has a clearly defined mission that appropriately reflects its character, values, structure, and unique student demographics. The institution's mission articulates its commission to ensuring equitable educational opportunities and outcomes for all students. Okay, so I think this is a way of acknowledging that standard is a way of acknowledging that um, all of our members, you know, you, unless you are clustered in a multi college district where you and your sister colleges are very, very close, um, you, you have different communities that you serve. Um, and I, I talk about, you know, I'm about to go on a site visit to the College of Micronesia, they do assessment. They do equity work. It is so different than the equity work that happens at, you know, West LA, which I'll be I'll be at West LA College the week before. You know, it's very different. How do we have standards that acknowledges both realities and where all of those colleges are? And it starts with understanding who your students are. It starts with understanding your student needs, as Dr. Lowe said. What do your students need? What does your community need? How do you know that you're serving those, uh, those students and meeting those needs? You can't do that, I don't think. Um, and this is just my bias coming out of um, institutional effectiveness offices, but I don't think you can do that unless you're looking at your data in meaningful ways. Um, so you, those standards, that standard that I just shared with you, the expectation is you have data that tells you what are the demographics of your students? What, is the, what are the values that you hold? How are you living into those values? And what data are you looking at that's meaningful and relevant that tells you, uh, helps you keep a pulse on or keep, keep your finger on the pulse of, what, of how your students' needs are changing because they change quickly as we know. Um, Dr. Webb, we do have a raised hand. Um, Aaron, would you oh, like yeah, to yeah. answer your question? Yeah, it's more of a question and statement. I think when we think about um, mission, a lot of us get into the mindset of our mission statement, but what was explained by ACCJC, and I will also be joining Catherine on that visit to West LA, so yay, that I, I think the key aspect is your mission is more encompassing than a statement. It's your goals, your values, your processes, your plan. What is your mission? It's not just a statement. So I think look beyond the scope of that. And I think when we started, and I was very lucky, and thank you, Catherine, to be on the writing team or the reading team of our ACCJC New Standards and really rethinking the process of what data tells the story. And I think it goes back to what you said. What qualitative, quantitative information do we give the autonomy of our faculty, of administrators, classified professionals, and students to tell that story? And I think that's something that we want to appreciate and think about with student learning. How do we utilize that as well? And so just, just think about that. Now that you have a broader scope into the dataverse, how are we telling that, that story of student learning? And I think I, I just wanted to, to plug in that thing about mission. It's beyond a statement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's such a great point. And, you know, when we do the training now for colleges and for teams, and, and Aaron knows this, having been on a, um, and a team ISA review with me, even during the team conversations, that's something that we're emphasizing over and over and over. The mission is not your mission statement. The mission statement can describe parts of who you are and what you do, but um, it, you know, it's more than that. So it doesn't have to be a laundry list of, you know, we're going to talk about all of the types of degrees we give, 
Um, we're going to talk about, because, you know, frankly, you can see that in the catalog. That's connected to your mission. And if I sat down with any one of you and said, I see this list of degrees, why do you offer these specific degrees? You would say, because our students need them. And our role as educators is to meet the needs of our students. You know, so it's bigger than just your mission statement. Absolutely. another question let me scroll up a little bit yeah sure <laughs> do it. um amanda asked how do we get our institution to see these new standards more holistically instead of how they used to be yeah that's a great question and you know that's certainly on my mind as um as the accjc team is thinking about our training and the tools that we develop um to support colleges as they're going through the process um i think a I think there's kind of the relationship piece and then the process piece, right? I think a big part of it is you have to believe locally that this is really truly an exercise about that is student-centered, not about fear. It's about improvement, not fear. Improvement in learning, not fear. You have to know that ACCJC is going to be working with you on areas that um, where you might not be aligned with standards. And we've actually adjusted our language so that we're talking a little bit less about like compliance, 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 and more about alignment, alignment, alignment. Um, it's a very subtle difference, but I think it's a very important one. Um, because if you go into, and I think I, I may have said this yesterday that. Um, Everything can be a tool or it can be a weapon. It depends on how you hold it. If you go into the endeavor with the idea that this is about compliance and if we don't do it perfectly, they're gonna, they're gonna come and get us. Um, or if you go into it with the idea that this is about learning and how can we be doing better for our students, even if at the end of that process, you come out of it with areas for improvement or recommendations to come into compliance with standards. Um, if you have started from the place of this is going to help us help our students more effectively, I think that it just feels much more, much different. It feels more like ACCJC is working with you rather than uh, against you or coming down from the top. Um, so that's part of it. It's, it's relationship and mindset. And then it's also structure. Um, it's about how do we frame the standards? How do we write the standards so the expectation is clear? How do we make sure that both the college and the peer review team members have a similar view of what the standards mean? Um, and what tools and trainings do we develop so that there's consistency? Um, I think that, and um, this will be really interesting. I know. Uh, Ray yesterday was saying that uh, Fresno City is going to be a pilot college. Uh, I think the whole district, State Center District, is piloting the new standards. So I'm really curious to hear from you as to whether some of what uh, that question is talking about, how do we get people to uh, uh, approach them with a different mindset, whether or not some of that is happening just because the language is more clear, there's more clarity in what the expectation uh, is and there's more flexibility in um, in those review criteria to really cover. Uh, you know, it's say that it's setting the principle. You're going to do this type of thing, but it's not telling you prescriptively what is it that you have to do. Um, so I'm curious just to hear how that's going. I think that's going to be a big part of it. And then we're developing things like uh, glossaries, so it's really clear that when ACCJC says outcomes, this is what we mean, you know, and that it's when we say outcomes, when I just say equitable outcomes, I'm not necessarily talking about learning outcomes only. I'm talking about results of a process or it, it is inclusive of uh, your learning outcomes data and your student achievement data, you know, so it's both. So making sure that those definitions are really, really clear um, so that people understand from the beginning, like, okay, in another process, it might mean this, but for the purposes of accreditation, this is what we're being asked. 
I think that clarity helps a lot. I do have a quick question about the logistics. So if the whole institution is involved in the ICER preparation process, what can ACCJC say about the timeline and structure of the necessary conversations? Yeah, so um, currently with the, the, current, uh, the current standards, we allow or we suggest the about two and a half years a process that for most public institutions, sometimes private institutions, you know, governance structures vary. So um, for the majority of our members who are California public, we say um, two and a half years is about what we want you to focus on. Um, start with your due date and work backwards. And um, think about who needs to sign off on the document based on the structure that you have locally and the way that you have organized big institutional conversations. Because again, it varies from college to college. So if you have a structure where, you know, the governing board is gonna do final approval, but before that you want um, input and approval from your Senate. You, uh, you, if you have an academic Senate and a classified Senate, for example, um, you want your outcomes committee to have a chance to look and provide feedback you know, all of those things. So think about who is gonna need to have those conversations and actually get out your calendar, your student your student senate. Yes, thank you, Bethany. Um, get out your calendar and say, when do these people meet and start mapping backwards? And that's really gonna help you in terms of how much wiggle room. Um, and I say this too, I have a friend uh, who's a contractor and in every bid he goes out for, he includes a line item, and I don't remember how much, but he always includes a line item for unforeseen difficulties, right? So give yourself time for unforeseen difficulties because you could have a really tight timeline. And if one thing, you know, if one meeting is canceled, then suddenly you're kind of scrambling. So give yourself some space, some wiggle room. And then ACCJC, you know, so a lot of that is up to how is the institution managing the conversations internally, but we also do the timing of our trainings and we try and check in with the colleges regularly to say, okay, how's it going? What questions do you have? What's come up since last we, we spoke, you know, um, so that it's not just radio silence. So the trainings have shifted. So now um, if you haven't been through this recently, you know, in the before times, <laughs> you might have one training where you send 10 people to um, a hotel conference room with four other colleges and ACCJC talks to you once and then you're, you're released. That's not how we do that anymore. We come to you and we say, you know, put us in a room with whoever you want from your institution to be involved. Maybe it's everybody. Um, and some colleges do that. They say, we're going to have everybody there. We come, we do a big training, we have a, a, a big conversation. And then another, a year later, we come back and say, let's follow up. Let's, um, and it can be, it can be virtually. Um, and I do, I've told the colleges that I work with, and I think this is very true for my colleagues, uh, Gohar and Kevin as well. Um, we are willing to zoom in to a meeting. Now that we, you know, we're used to Zoom now. And so if you're doing a, um, if you have a steering committee, and a question comes up and you think we don't know what the standard means or there's a process piece that we don't know how to go forward with or we need some interpretation you know we're just a we're just a zoom away you know so we can come in in the in the, in the middle too so um yeah that was a very long question a long answer i hope i i hope i helped okay i think gohar has actually zoomed in in some of my campuses meetings so we really yeah. appreciate that um, can I follow that up a little bit? And I know Enrique has a question in the chat, but do you, um, does ACCJC maybe make some recommendations about who should be in some of those rooms when you come to do the training? So asking, you know, by the way, will your classified Senate members also be present? Will your student Senate president or members also be present? Is that a recommendation that comes with the new training? Yeah, yeah. And there's some, um, there's some information about there's some process information and some suggestions in the guide to institutional self-evaluation, which you can download on, from our website. 
And obviously we'll be updating the guide as part of our implementation of the new standards, but that part of it, I don't think will change much. Got it. You know, that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. You know, we want, and because it's an institutional self-evaluation, who is the institution? It's everybody, right? And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to shift this training so that if you want to invite, um, if you want to invite a broad audience, the only limitation is how big is the room? How big is the room? You know, so students, certainly um, when you're when you're organizing your, um, a, a, the way that we have designed the trainings now, they're kind of chunked into two halves. So the first half is kind of an overarching why and what are the principles and what are those, that framework for self-reflection that I shared, those four questions. You know, what are you about to do and why are you doing it? Um, and what are the, what's the federal component of it? And who is ACCJZ anyway? You know, some of those big mindset questions. That's appropriate for uh, a really big, broad audience. And, you know, I've done this in a barn. Literally, I did this training in a barn so that we at, at uh, Modesto Junior College so that they could have a really big room, a really big group of people. Um, students, faculty, administrators, um, trustees, you know, this first half is really appropriate for a wide audience. And then the second half of the training gets into interpretation of standards. And we structure it this way so that if there, you have a core team of folks that's really going to be diving into not just the writing, but the approval process and the dialogue process on the back end. You know, you've got the high level, which kind of talks about the, the overarching stuff, and then you have a more focused level. And so it's appropriate even to split that out. And so you have two separate groups of people who come to those trainings. Love it. Um, I think probably the last question, just so we have time to breathe in between. Um, Enrique asked in the chat, how do we move from student achievement success data to focusing on learning? Um, student success data does not ensure that learning took place. That's a great question. I love that question. And I think, you know, I think you need both. When you're thinking about success in generally, in general, you know, um, you need to think about both because you're absolutely right. The success data, you know, you can get, I mean, I have, as a student, I can remember classes where I know I got an A in that class. If you ask me what I learned in that class, I do not remember. And I probably could not go back and tell you, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about, you know, chemistry, I'm looking at you, I got an A in chemistry, but if you ask me what that, what any of those things mean, I don't know, you know, so you're absolutely right. The achievement data does not tell you the whole story. You really, if you're thinking about how are we serving our students, it's part of it because if they start out with a goal and they don't finish, you certainly wanna know why, but that the, I think the assessment data helps you answer the why questions. Um, it's thinking about it from the perspective of mixed methods almost where you have some questions that are more descriptive and quantitative in nature and, and you can say, well, here's what happened, but we don't know why. Why is a much harder question to answer. And so the assessment data, when you go back and you look at that and you're teasing out and you're looking at you know, patterns of whether or not students are demonstrating ma mastery of certain outcomes over multiple semesters or across multiple sections, and you're diving in and you're saying which students were successful the way that they talked about yesterday. I love flipping it around, like who was successful versus who was not successful. And looking at it from both directions, I think that helps you understand who's represented in the achievement data and more importantly, who's not represented in the achievement mm -hmm. data. You can, I don't think you can talk about the achievement data meaning in meaningful ways, unless you go back into your assessment data and you start thinking about why. Thank you. That was, uh, that was a great answer to that. So um, I think we can call it, we're going to call it a minute early. I don't think anyone will be upset about that. <laughs> um, as long as Jarek doesn't get mad at me. Um, oh. We are, <laughs> we're, we're, uh, after this, we have the 
um, statewide academic senate for California Community Colleges coming to talk to us. But I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Webb. Thank you for your time, um, your honesty. We threw a couple hard balls at you there, and I just really appreciate um, that that you were able to be here and share your time with us. So, oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so we're back at eleven. Take a few moments. Um, you know, get 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 up and move around if you need to. Uh, stretch a bit, and we will see you in six minutes. <laughs> All right. Good morning again. Uh, it's eleven o'clock. It's time for our Academic Senate discussion. And here they are with us, uh, Robert Stewart and Cheryl Ashenbach from representing the uh, Academic Senate for California Community Colleges. And our moderators, Alicia Bettencourt from uh, San Diego City College, Amanda Tainter from Ridley College, Bethany Tasaka from San Bernardino Valley College. Uh, Alicia, you are the first on my list. Do you mind to start? Sure. Um, good morning again, everyone. Um, so just very briefly, um, should I introduce both speakers and then let them do their thing? Yeah. I okay. Think best, yes. um, so um, looking through um, their bios, um, Robert Stewart um, is previous part-time adjunct professor and um, reading through his bio kind of just spoke to, spoke to my experience as well, um, how he was piecing together his workloads um, and wasn't really involved in academic senate because when you are, you know, going from school to school and trying to just fit in your schedule, it's really hard to do so. Um, but then, you know, 10 years ago or around 10 years ago when he became full time, um, he started getting involved in program review um, and academic senate and he has just spent so much time looking at um, serving for faculty and leadership and doing his best to help um, faculty and students and he is um, associate professor of biology at la southwest college um, and one of the executive um, committee members um, of ac ASCCC. and then cheryl Aschenbach um, has been uh, an executive committee member for over five years of the AC ASCCC, um, and um, she has 20 plus years of full-time faculty experience um, in the Department of English. And um, looking at her bio, she spends a lot of time, again, looking at leadership um, for faculty, empowerment, giving faculty a voice, um, and helping them navigate the regulations to best serve and facilitate um, student success. So welcome to both of you. I'm really excited to hear some of these updates. All right. Thank you, Alicia. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, Alicia, I can't Thank see. <laughs> Let me uh, share. Okay. All right, there we go. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings from the Academic Center for California Community Colleges. Uh, we are excited, uh, Jerick and, and uh, Enrique, for inviting us to uh, participate in the symposium and to update the field on what the Academic Center for California Community Colleges are engaged in around uh, student learning and success and provide you guys with some uh, updates. Uh -oh. There it is. All right, um, as we were introduced, uh, we have Cheryl Aschenbach, our vice president, and I'm the South representative. I will also add that I am a uh, six year local Senate president over at Los Angeles Southwest College. And so I'm uh, walking away from that um, I term out uh, this uh, June. So I'm excited to, um, to exist in other spaces of, of faculty leadership moving forward. Uh, Cheryl, you have anything you want to add? No, that's okay. I like how you said you're uh, going to walk away. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you have to. Otherwise, you'll be there for 15, 20 years. Doing... I get it. I get it. <laughs> All right. Um, the first thing we would like to do is to uh, sort of uh, make sure that because this is the Student Learning Objective Symposium, to make sure that we ground our presence uh, into um, the 10 plus 1 which student learning outcomes, you know, will 
will fit in. So if we look at the basis for academic sentence in our purview, things that we have primacy in making recommendations over at the state level, also at our district and local levels, we have the 10 plus one that I'm sure uh, you've all heard about, but if not, just looking at, for instance, one through five, this is all about curriculum and degrees and uh, certificates, uh, program development. And so we know when we, we're looking at um, program learning objectives, course learning objectives, uh, these are very important things. And what it says in the 10 plus one basically is that uh, the faculty voice needs to be uh, strong and how we do this and, and how we imagine things like student learning outcomes. And so you'll always uh, see faculty involvement in uh, any of these areas, whether it's statewide or local or district-wide. Um, some other things uh, that would be um, something that the SLO community would want to pay attention to is uh, district and college governance, right? Um, having an SLO committee and, and, and how that's going to operate. And of course, faculty should be, uh, you know, a, a good force on any uh, SLO committee. Uh, faculty and roles and involvement in accreditation process. So we just saw Catherine uh, present for the ACCJC, and I've had the pleasure of presenting with Catherine a couple of times now. And, um, and the accreditation pro uh, process is clear uh, that we should be uh, measuring the um, our students' uh, success and, and also improving our courses uh, all the time. Uh, the other things, uh, professional development activities, faculty should have a voice in what professional development activities we engage in, including, right, this, we have a lot of faculty that come to the SLO event uh, yearly and the Friday events and things like that. Uh, program review, we know, is aligned very well with with SLOs and um, program learning objectives. And so those things go hand in hand and so on and on. And so we wanted to make sure that we grounded our presence in the fact that we look out for academic and professional matters on the statewide level to make sure that we empower the, the faculty and, and give them a voice and provide leadership in these academic and professional matters. Uh, Shro, you wanna add anything? No, you covered that really well. Yeah. All right, the topics that we want to share with you guys today, a little bit about general education, what's going on currently in general, general education in the Senate's work, ethnic studies, including the competencies, um, inclusion, diversity, equity, anti-racism, and access and curriculum, uh, baccalaureate degrees, uh, CBE, our competency-based education, uh, equitable placement and enrollment, and then uh, the Open Educational Resources Initiative, and um, and any other additional efforts that are currently uh, going on. You guys have had a lot of good topics for this um, symposium, and so what we aim to do is to sort of tell you what we're doing to help assist at the state level and all of these great things that are going on across the state. Um, in, in the areas of student learning and student success. Thanks for getting us started, Robert. And again, good morning, everybody. It's always a, a pleasure to come and uh, listen to what folks are talking about at this uh, symposium. I uh, didn't get a chance to attend yesterday because of other commitments, but today, just this morning's comments, which from Aisha to Aaron to Catherine, like so exciting where our system is going and the 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 focus uh, in all aspects, less on compliance and more of what are our students learning? Not just, you know, what are those outcomes? How are our grades? How many are completing degrees as it relates, especially so often to the funding conversation, but really so much more around what are our students learning, gaining, and able to do when they leave our institutions? Um, all the things we're gonna talk about tie to that in some way, although they're not, uh, you know, outright conversations about SLOs. Uh, to start with, General education, the core of all of our associate degree earners, whether they're earning local degrees or they're earning uh, associate degrees for transfer or they're in our baccalaureate system and earning baccalaureate degrees now that we have not just an original 15 pilots, but more, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, if you are um, have paid attention to legislation in the last couple of years at all, I'm sure you've heard AB 928, Berman's 2021 bill, 
Uh, it is, it, it, there's multiple prongs to it. And, and the overall emphasis of the bill was to improve transfer to CSU and, and um, UCs. A piece of that was charged the Intersegmental Committee of Academic Senates, so the Academic Senate leadership from UC, CSU, and the community colleges to construct a new, uh, what, what they're calling singular, it really should just be single, um, transfer pathway in general education to our four-year partners. And uh, that work started February of last year, uh, resulted in early recommendations around a framework for that general education pathway. Uh, it was vetted. Uh, it, I think our first real open conversations around it was at the Curriculum Institute last year, and then continuing through webinars in August, September, um, opportunities for surveys into fall plenary, where we asked our delegates to uh, vote on whether they supported the framework or not. And, you know, recognizing we're in a tough spot. It's been legislated to us in the way that the framework was written or the, the legislation was written rather, uh, gave faculty the, the task. And if the uh, faculty couldn't come up with a single pathway by May of 2023, so coming soon in our future here, it would be turned over to our the administrative elements of our segments. And um, as faculty, we didn't want that to happen. So we worked really hard to, you know, try to be responsive, try to um, bring in broad input across our three systems and come up with something that uh, is largely built on uh, existing frameworks, but really taking into account what each has, what each, what will be accepted by the different institutions you see in CSU, and uh, what that means to our students. So uh, the result of that is is proposed as Cal Getze, California General Education Transfer Curriculum. It would be the way to transfer um, or, or the GE package for students rather than I Getze or CSU GE Breath. Um, it would become core part of our associate degrees for transfer. Uh, that is the, all three systems faculty have weighed in. ICUS meets in the next week, finally, to kind of pull those inputs and supports together, uh, talk and, and consider additional feedback that has been received, particularly around lifelong learning and self-development. We've heard a lot about concerns about that not being included. Um, and uh, we'll then you know, work to finalize the framework. There's still a lot of unknowns and, and more work to be done. It's the framework that has to be set by the uh, date of May 2023. But as we know, implementation, there's a lot of elements to still be worked out. Um, you know, I get C and CSU GE Breath both have handbooks or guiding notes. Uh, and so that will need to be developed. And, and part of that will be uh, in the new areas for Cal C, new in the sense that if they weren't in I get C, which was the one pathway we already had that transfers to both CSU and UC. Uh, oral communication wasn't in there, ethnic studies wasn't in there. And so as we're adding those two in, making adjustments to still keep it under the 34 unit cap, um, it, we're gonna have to do some more work about what, what the framework, what the, the um, needs are, what the guiding notes are for uh, inclusion and approval courses in those two areas. And so that work will continue. And I think we'll lay the framework for that at ICUS uh, with our meeting next week, really relying um, on faculty in those disciplines to help to shape those competencies. Along the same time, the Senate suggested that if we're talking about uh, the composition of general education frameworks for transfer, let's take a look at our own Title V regulations around transfer. Uh, if uh, you've worked general education with students at all, it can be very confusing because there are three different patterns, a local pattern, the CSU GE breath, and I get C, and they all have different structures. I get C is, you know, areas one, two, three, four, and so on. Uh, CSU GE breath uses area A, B, C, uh, D, and E. And locally, we as colleges may set them up uh, in different ways. And uh, really, Title V only requires 18 units of general education. Uh, and some of our colleges have built additional elements into our uh, their general education patterns beyond what uh, is required. And so um, we talked about wanting, it would be a lot easier to know if we refer to area one or area A, whatever the final kind of title of that is that we're talking about composition um, and, and communication and critical thinking. And so, you know, oral, written and critical thinking um, rather than, you know, one and one A and, and E, A, E. And so um, the Senate proposed a resolution, delegates supported it to revisit and, and uh, really mirror the framework of our local GE patterns after uh, Cal Getze, not to mean that the criteria for courses to be approved in those areas would be the same because our local GE patterns um, course alignment to those 
areas is determined locally at our colleges rather than by UC or CSU as with the other patterns, um, but at least so that we could have some consistent um, framing. Uh, the same then rings true with our baccalaureate degrees that uh, they currently uh, need students to have a lower division pre GE prep of I get CRC, CSU GE breath. Well, knowing that those are going away, um, certainly Calgetsy could be an option, but a lot of our colleges have expressed uh, frustration that there is so much general education, 39 units, if student takes it at the CSU GE breath option, uh, that it, it, it adds more units to already high unit degrees in our uh, baccalaureate degrees in our system, as well as uh, includes, you know, coursework that may not be critical to our students who are uh, really moving their way right into the workforce or already working and in, in advancing their degree attainment. Uh, and so we're looking to have the lower division portion of our baccalaureate degree general education um, be again framed, structured the same way as whatever's decided on the associate degree. So a lot of work going on in that area and still a lot of conversations to have. Next slide, please. And throughout, please, we encourage you to uh, drop your questions into the chat. We'd be happy to answer them. This is a visual alignment of what that those three patterns would look like. Again, looking, you know, this way we know area one will be consistent. If we refer our students and, you know, are considering courses for area three, we know that's arts and humanities. It, it, it wouldn't be inconsistently referred to uh, depending on the pattern a student was prepping for. Uh, next slide, please. Can get the next slide, please. I was talking, I wasn't unmuted. And that's what Jared told us to make sure we did was unmute ourselves and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add sure of that for AB 928 before we move on that it did call for an exploration of a potential increase in the cap for, for STEM. Uh, the units for STEM in order to uh, try to allow for there to be an easier way to have ADTs for those high unit uh, STEM uh, majors um, that the cap currently uh, prevents uh, us from being able to adequately uh, take care of. Yeah, that's, thank you for remembering to mention that, Robert. I appreciate that. You know, STEM person, I always want to talk STEM. <laughs> it's been a challenge for our, you know, 60 unit cap lower division. Uh, next slide. Okay, there it is. So we're doing a lot of work in ethnic studies. Uh, as is appropriate, we know that it's been added Title V general education for our system. We know that CSU it was legislated to be included and is, is counted as Area F now. UC had taken action to include it in IGETSI uh, in the future, uh, not currently this year, but in the future. And so it, it as the CalGETSI structure was considered, ethnic studies was uh, one of the new areas that, you know, right now introduced as Area 6, I think. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it means pulling units from one of the other areas, social and behavioral sciences, uh, but it is included in that pattern. Uh, UC, well, first CSU had their competencies developed uh, when it was mandated by uh, Senate Bill 1460, I think. And uh, UC then, as they were considering uh, adding it to IGETC and, and making it part of their general education, requirements, they worked on competencies. Of course, you know, they couldn't just adopt CSUs. They had to find ways to tweak them and make them their own. Uh, and then as we have been working on uh, partially helping support colleges uh, earn area F uh, approval for their courses. So looking at CSU competencies uh, within their ethnic studies coursework, but then also prepared to, you know, have students or have colleges uh, evaluate which courses meet local ethnic studies requirements as per Title V, competencies were developed by our system. And they really worked, our ethnic studies faculty on the ethnic studies council and work group uh, worked really hard to integrate both the CSU and UC competency language into our community college ethnic studies competencies with the intent that uh, colleges not to have, have to, don't have to have multiple sets of competencies depending on where they're going to uh, seek GE approval that really um, we're, hasn't been confirmed yet, but we're hoping that the language is consistent enough as a meld between the CSU and UC versions that uh, if they're, if our colleges have those competencies within an ethnic studies course, our goal is that they be accepted by UC and CSU. Uh, those competencies are being finalized through the CID process, so vetting went out to a broader sense of ethnic studies faculty, and I think the, the last little piece really is where they are is 
Where are those competencies going to live? On the CID website, through the chancellor's office. This is kind of a new space to talk about what competencies look like for some aspect of general education uh, for our system. And so, you know, it's just really, really right now the, that logistics piece um, before those are um, made more public and, and considered final. Um, at the same time around ethnic studies, we've been working on developing associate degrees for transfer. Uh, there are five under development and they are, again, pretty close to being final. Uh, one is just a broad ethnic studies and then there's four additional in the four core ethnic studies areas, African American studies, Indian studies, Asian American studies and Chicano Chicana studies. Um, those have gone through vetting. So again, gone out to the field, ethnic studies faculty having input and uh, are being finalized recommendations coming back to the Intersect Metal Committee work group or curriculum work group that where CSU and, and us sit together. The draft TMCs are available on the CID website and there's a link to them on that slide if you wanna go take a look at what coursework's included in them. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, that's thing we wanna talk about is a very important work being done around idea, again, inclusion, diversity, equity, anti-racism and, and accessibility in curriculum. And so um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the model principles and practices, uh, the DEI equity and curriculum. Uh, this was a, a framework that was developed in collaboration with several uh, uh, main groups in the state. So you had the uh, co the commun California Community Colleges Chancellor's Office. We had the Student Senate for uh, California Community Colleges. We also had 5C, which uh, stands for the California Community Colleges Curriculum Committee. And then we also had the, uh, the California Community Colleges Chief Instructional Officers Group all collaborate in coming up with a framework uh, that um, colleges can ground this work in. And I should have started off by saying that through the resolutions process at, uh, at our fall plenary in 2021, there was, a, uh, there was a resolution that passed in order to include um, the DEI in the course outline of record. And so there's a lot of work that's being done to uh, make sure that the field has all of the tools that they need to be able to do this work. So the framework, uh, model principles and practices is just one aspect, but also in 5C, there is a work group uh, that's called the DEI and core and DEI framework implementation work group that's working on a toolkit also as a resource to uh, further assist um, the, the field in being able to realize this very important work. Um, in your symposium this week, I've seen uh, various aspects of DEI work mentioned, and we all know that, you know, it, it's not universally uh, accepted, right? There, there is some pushback for this kind of work, and, and a lot of it is grounded in the sense that uh, folks just don't know uh, how to get this work started and how to bring everybody on board. And so the SCCC is uh, largely engaged in helping to create resources to assist the field to, to get started in this work and to sort of ground what they do every day for student success and learning uh, in IDEA, uh, including curriculum. So this is a very, very important work. Uh, we also uh, have linked a Rostrum article from November, 2021, that was written on moving the needle, uh, a cultural responsiveness and anti-racism in the course outline of record. And so uh, please use these resources uh, as they're linked. I, I think that you're gonna get this presentation. So the links are live. And so uh, make sure you share this widely uh, so that uh, everyone knows that, you know, the work is, could be difficult um, but there's a lot of resources being created to assist the field to get through uh, this type of work. Uh, Cheryl? No, I just want to echo that Susie put it in the chat and, and just uh, reemphasize that uh, folks can access the slide deck back in the events lobby uh, under the sessions tab. Okay. Gonna, we'll Thank you, Susie. Over. 
Okay, um, and this is just an update on the baccalaureate uh, degrees. Um, what we can report out is that there are new baccalaureate degrees approved. Um, we know that there are 15 original uh, programs in baccalaureate programs in the pilot group. And as of right now, we have 10 uh, applications in um, 2022, and nine of those have been approved. And so we're moving steadily ahead uh, with our baccalaureate degree programs, which is fantastic, uh, fulfilling a need uh, for, for students, especially in these areas that you can't find a particular baccalaureate degree or uh, maybe even... Uh, you know, you have to go too far to get to a particular uh, program. We're hoping that will become uh, a, a manner in which we also be able to create these baccalaureate programs. Uh, the application program currently is two application periods per year, one in January and one in August. And so uh, for January 2023, there are 29 new applications, but there is a limit of 15 approvals per period. So what this is saying is that we see a, a, a desire, a huge desire and a need for these baccalaureate programs uh, at our community colleges. And uh, so the process is, is obviously gonna be very competitive, um, but um, I, I think I believe, and, and Aisha may have mentioned this in her um, today, um, in that they are looking to maybe scale back the two application periods to one application period. Uh, but that hasn't uh, occurred yet. And we know also that there, there, are, there is a handbook available for the baccalaureate degrees, uh, but that, that handbook is being upgraded, obviously, um, to align with things that are going on. It's no longer a pilot program, so therefore we, we have to update the handbook. Uh, sure. No, it's just baccalaureate degrees are an exciting opportunity for our students, particularly those that are more place bound and you know need a baccalaureate degree to advance in a field. Uh, the fact that we have 29 more applications for this period uh, is incredible. I mean, that already in applications alone is doubling the number of approved programs that we have. Uh, it's not an easy path. Colleges have to put in a lot of work. And some of you know that firsthand because you're part of those committees on your campus and, and doing some of the background work to prepare. Uh, but those applications are rigorous. There's a lot of information there to help ensure that a program can be successful for students right off the bat and that the college has the resources and the commitment to sustain a program and then that there's jobs available in, in the given field when students complete. And so um, I think the reading for the new applications is going to be happening early February. Uh, there's the sticky issue of having to uh, have CSU, I, I won't say approval, but but that CSU would agree that that uh, each proposal doesn't duplicate something already in the CSU. And that's where there's been some sticky um, challenges. And that's why there's only nine of 10 approved currently from last year's application period. They did only do one period last year because they were working through so many parts of the process it took longer. Um, but Feather River College is still waiting uh, and CSU has um, objected to some duplication concerns and you know, not quite sure how to resolve that because it's not clear uh, some would say in the in the legislative language. So in the meantime, we're just trying, you know, encouraging colleges. I will say I have heard very uh, a great deal of support from our board of governors, from the chancellor's office, and and uh, you know, going back to the pilot programs, that hasn't always been the case. And so you know, in so many other ways, our, our system is evolving to you know really identify what it is that students need and how we can provide that. And baccalaureate degrees are an area where I think there's been a shift in in support and attitude towards them. So really looking forward to see that going. I see a couple of questions about the handbook. It used to be available on the chancellor's office website but because I think it's you know titled the pilot degree handbook. Uh, they've pulled it down. You can find it through a search on their page. It's not an easy one. You can also Google it. A number of colleges have it linked off of their own sites as well. Um, you know, it has information about things like MinQuals in there, uh, which in that case, MinQuals are slightly wrong because that's what was approved by our system at the same time uh, back in 2014-15, ACCJC was establishing what the requirements for minimum quals for um, as, uh, associate degree granting baccalaureate institutions would have. And so, um, you know, th those are a couple of things, the general education, uh, the, having consistency with the uh, requirements for minimum quals that ACCJC has, 
um, those are some of the things that we'll be updating in that handbook. And, and there's an advisory committee now with the chancellor's office that is doing that work uh, as well as to, uh, really looking at what professional development is needed for our system uh, and, and recognizing that there's a lot we can learn from the 15 original colleges and the personnel involved in those original applications, the launching and even the sustaining. And so those colleges will continue to take a role in, in supporting the colleges who are coming on board uh, now and into the future. Thank you, Bethany, for the link in the chat. Appreciate that. I think this comes back to me. So, um, you know, certainly I've heard it referenced a couple of times just in today's conversations, the Compsity Based Education Collaborative. Um, that, that group did a lot of work in the last year and a half, the eight colleges involved. Uh, we as the Senate haven't necessarily um, been real active in supporting uh, that work. We've, we were uh, through 5C, part of the, the regulatory development, uh, but since then, the collaborative really is a, a not even a, necessarily a chancellor's office effort. It's more a foundation and student success center um, effort supporting our colleges. And so we, though, are starting to hear from some of our faculty leaders in those uh, at those colleges who are in those conversations uh, that they might need a little bit more support. And so uh, we just, Stephanie Curry uh, from our executive committee and from Needley College sent an email out to uh, Senate presidents, curriculum chairs, and faculty points of contact at the eight collaborative colleges just this last week um, to, you know, partly see what uh, support is needed, but also uh, to start to arrange some sort of, you know, virtual get togethers so that we can um, pull folks. The eight colleges don't need to be doing this alone, particularly the faculty. Um, we can certainly collaborate. That was the intention all along um, and uh, do some work together to help uh, support their efforts because like the baccalaureate degree uh, work that was done really early, the rest of our system will benefit and, and learn a lot from the folks doing the work first. So we're aiming to be a little bit more of a support for the collaborative colleges and the faculty at the collaborative colleges moving forward. Next slide, please. Uh, we all, I think, know a lot uh, has been happening around equitable placement and enrollment. Uh, AB 1705 uh, went into effect January 1st of now this new year. And uh, you can link to the bill language. A chancellor's office memo came out right before Christmas. It was kind of like delivered to our stockings, I, I swear, or you know, kind of dropped in so that we'd get it when we came back into email after the new year. Uh, but you know, there's certainly no argument that 705 has increased access to transfer level math and English and uh, increase the number of students com successfully completing transfer level math and English. Uh, we continue to be concerned about the students that are getting lost in that process uh, from those that enroll and drop before census. Uh, we don't know what's happening to those students. So we're encouraging colleges to you know, ask for data around that. Are they enrolling in other sections? Are they waiting a semester enrolling in math and English later? Are they enrolling in you know, other disciplines but not math and English? or are they walking away from our colleges altogether? It's hard to say because that data is not kept or collected on a state level. It's really college by college. Um, so uh, the chancellor's office has a webinar February 7th to talk more about what's in the guidance memo. And we'll continue to you know, try to work with the chancellor's office and, and absolutely work with all of you to support you and your students however we can. Next slide. Okay, um, we wanna talk a little bit about our um, OERI, Open Educational Resources Initiative. And um, of course we know that we're making things more equitable when we reduce the cost or take away the cost of learning materials for students as all students don't have the same access uh, to funds and resources to, uh, to be able to have learning materials and, and that could set up a situation where students can't take courses or can't complete programs um, just simply because they can't afford to uh, get the events and so there's a huge push uh, by the SCCC and the field to increase the amounts of open educational resources and so on our page on ASCCC.org you can scroll down to the bottom of that page and you'll see uh, the OE our initiative uh, link. And in there, they have uh, web webinars and events, including the, the Friday forms. And if you're interested in those forms, they're held every first and third Friday from 1030 to 1130, um, with the, the note that in February, 
um, because of holidays, they will be held on the first and the fourth Friday rather than the first and the third Friday. And so all of the, the shared resources uh, that are already developed can be found on that link as well. And then there's also, there also has been developed by the OERI uh, group, a framework for IDEA. So the inclusion, diversity, equity, anti-racism. And so it's important as we're doing this work, this IDEA work that uh, we do supply the field with a framework around, you know, how this can be done, why it should be done and, and how we should be thinking about it and why it's important. Uh, also, you see a link for a student impact toolkit. And, and I think so many times uh, we do all our work that we do for the students, but sometimes we'll leave the student voice out of what we're doing, which is never okay. And so with the student impact toolkit, what you'll be able to see there are the voices of the students and how they're impacted uh, by course materials and, and costs and, and how they've been impacted in good ways by the open educational resources efforts. And so you'll see various videos uh, that feature our students and also data uh, that's uh, being shown to show the effect of the OERI efforts on student success. And then yeah. if you're- oh, I can't, ahead, I can't speak enough about the uh, Academic Senate's Open Educational Resources Initiative efforts. And Amanda's putting some information in the chat um, she's been a, a you know, very uh, involved uh, and engaged leader in this effort uh, with us and for us. Um, I would say uh, two things. If, if you, and uh, as Amanda said, like if you're having difficulty finding OER, look here for your discipline because some there's been intention about trying to fill gaps in our system where there isn't anything, whether we're talking about textbook alternatives or whether we're talking about instructional support materials, including homework systems and, and homework support. Uh, and so there's there's certainly things in there and disciplines you might not expect. And if you are interested in, in playing a role in developing OER, uh, it does there in the request for proposals, there is a requirement that it's you know inter uh, district collaboration, so two or more districts. But uh, OERI will help connect you with faculty in your discipline from other districts who may also be interested but don't necessarily know who else to contact to engage. Um, we're really you know there's incredible resources in there and. I, I look through them and, and you know venture into the, some of them uh, for disciplines that I don't teach, but it is uh, just incredible the work that our faculty have done for our students. And I, you know I suspect many of you already use OER, but I would say the thing I love the most is that my students have access to their material on the first day of class. They have not had to go search or pay for a textbook. And so not only is it about accessing the class materials immediately, it's about having no cost to do that for our students. Um, and it really changes how I can launch the first part of a class um, because we can be talking about something that they've read uh, right away rather than, you know, kind of waiting and, and scaffolding until I'm pretty certain most students have the book um, or the other materials that I might request. So um, there is the request for proposals open until February 22nd. And the if you look at that link, there is information about how to, you know, kind of uh, seek help in finding collaborators if that's something you're interested in. And I'd like to add to that, uh, we want to make sure that we're not afraid to move in this direction. I know uh, some colleagues in, in the some of the STEM fields where you have, you know, books, textbooks that have been used, you know, for decades and decades and decades that become sort of like the book that people respect in a particular field. Um, I've been told by some faculty that they're wary about transfer institutions potentially uh, frowning upon uh, using these open educational resources rather than uh, the books that everybody sort of uh, are, is familiar with. And, and I want to uh, make sure that I encourage you, if you're in, let's say, biological sciences or chemistry or whatnot, there are resources that are open uh, for those areas. And I do uh, encourage you to go ahead and use those. Uh, for your students, because I mean, I, I, I'll tell you a story just quickly. Um, when I was an undergrad, there I took a, a course called um, embryology, and it had an atlas in it that we needed to be able to um, reference the things that we were seeing under the microscope and early developmental embryos of, of different animals. And this this was way back in uh, the the late '90s. 
and that book costed back then $350. I could not afford it, but luckily I did have a student job at the library and I had, you know, I was one of the people that created accounts, uh, library accounts uh, for um, in the um, in the reserve materials area. And I was able to, and, and you know, I, I guess this was dishonest of me, but I had to do what I had to do. I uh, re, uh, I, I changed the status on my account to a graduate student. And that allowed for me to take that book out for the whole semester versus uh, two hours at a time. And so I got through that class because I was able to have that book. But if I didn't have that book, even if I could take it out two hours at a time, uh, it would have been difficult for me to keep up in my course. And so this is very, very important work. Thank you, next slide. There you go. So the Senate's busy doing some other stuff that, that certainly touches uh, student learning as well. Um, one, you've likely heard of the Common Course Numbering Effort, AB 1111. Uh, there is a committee for that or a work group. Uh, they are having their third meeting in a couple of weeks. And, um, you know, really the bill is saying that we will have common course numbering. There's been four previous legislative, or this is the fourth legislative attempt to have common course numbering in our system. Um, it is CID was the, the third, and, and we've made some progress on that. And we're expecting that uh, we can learn from CID and build on it in order to have something that um, meets the bill requirements for being student facing, uh, especially. And I don't think there's any doubt that it can be really good for our students, uh, absolutely, to have more consistent common numbering across our systems. The court, Mary, great question. The quarter system is still a huge question. We're not that far into some of the weeds yet. Uh, really talking more, getting some background about some districts who have engaged in common course numbering in, in actually three districts in three different ways. So it's interesting to see that. I'm still kind of information gathering at this point with the first two meetings. I'm so looking forward to that next meeting. We are doing a lot of work in rising scholars as well and supporting our students who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated. Um, and not just students, but their families as well. Because uh, you know, when we talk about incarceration, it's a familial effect. It's not just our, the students themselves. Um, the Chancellor's Office and the Rising Scholars Network has some fantastic resources. That's the first link there. And we're working in partnership with the Rising Scholars Coordinators to stay in touch with what they're offering and how we can better support faculty directly rather than where they tend to direct a little or support a little bit more at the program level and program leadership level. Um, we also just launched learning modules for faculty who are teaching in incarcerated spaces. Uh, it's titled Teaching in CDCR Equity and Curriculum Resource Guide. It is specifically uh, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation because that's a grant that uh, made this work possible. But uh, as I was responding to a faculty uh, email this morning asking if they can use that to modify um, for their efforts teaching in the jail environment, absolutely. Those are Canvas courses. They are openly licensed and uh, we intend to put them on a Canvas Commons so you can, your college can you know, improve or, or add them to whatever professional development you're doing locally. Um, but there's a lot of great information there about supporting students. In this case, specifically in incarceration, but uh, we have a new Rising Scholars Faculty Advisory Committee with the Academic Senate uh, who is working both to, um, you know, kind of augment what's going on with uh, what right now through June is a grant funded effort, but then also do more uh, in the space of formerly incarcerated. What can we as faculty in particular do to support efforts to support students on our own campuses? So we'll continue to do that. Um, another legislative driven um, effort is AB 89, the Modern Policing Duty Program. Um, Assembly member Joan Sawyer uh, brought that out 2021. The Chancellor's Office is, um, has pulled together a task force that is community college, has community college representatives as well as uh, law enforcement representatives from POST in particular, because that's where the training guidelines come from, um, but then other uh, organizations throughout the state related to law enforcement. And we're really talking about um, what can we do uh, to improve training uh, and, and um, build in education to the requirements to be a law enforcement officer in California. Um, that group has met twice, three times now uh, and will continue to meet to make recommendations by the end of the spring semester. Um, I, I fully anticipate there will be then you know, additional work groups pulled together in the future to really talk about uh, deploying the, the recommendations at our local colleges and supporting it. But as we're seeing from uh, the, the most recent um, crime against 
a black man, uh, we uh, need to continue to talk about how to improve modern policing. Um, and that's really the task that that group is, has been uh, given. Sure. There, was a, there was a oh. question in the chat. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. There was a question in the chat about um, how are they handling schools that are on a quarter system? Yeah, that common course numbering question. Uh, we do have three colleges in the community college system uh, that are on quarters. And so uh, it, it's, we, we, we've recognized that fact uh, and I, I'm fortunate to serve on that committee. And so it's been, you know, at least mentioned as one of the things we need to consider and, and you know, how do we overcome that? Uh, I don't know what that will look like yet. Um, do the resource guides have embedded interpreters or captioning listed? Um, we've included links to transcripts and, cap and, and captionings included. I don't, we did not embed uh, interpreters in any of the videos that we produced anyway as part of that um, resource guide. Um, that, that was all faculty developed and we'll continue to add to it. Um, and there's an opportunity on the, in there uh, to you know, provide feedback to us. If there's, we have a handful of modules we'll, we're continuing to develop this spring, um, but we'd be happy to take input um, on what should, you know, what's, what's missing uh, and what can be further developed even. Thank you for those questions. Okay. Robert, I think you're the next one. Next slide, please. All right, um, this is just an upcoming event. We had two events here, but one has been recently canceled. We, we were going to have an accreditation regional event. Um, I think people are not quite ready to, to, to come to uh, import person regional events, um, but we do have a part-time faculty regional meeting, which is virtual. Uh, that's around equity for part-time faculty in the California Community College System. And that's going to be on February 24th from 12.30 uh, p.m. to 4 p.m. Um, there's a link right, right here, and you can uh, go ahead and forward that widely uh, to especially to uh, part-time faculty uh, so that they can, um, uh, so they can attend there. Yeah, it's free. It's free. <laughs> Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, we can probably drop the slides at this point. Yeah, and then there's some, there's some additional resources and also um, a thank you there. So we're gonna stop sharing so we can see all your lovely faces. Um, I had a quick question whenever you're ready. I don't know if it's quick or not. <laughs> Go, Go for ahead. it. Um, and you briefly touched on this when talking about ASCCC's um, increased involvement in competency-based education, but we've had a lot of conversations about shifting the terminology from outcomes to maybe skills and competencies. And, and what do you see as ASCCC's involvement in shifting that language or support of um, uh, making that, that shift from an outcomes to maybe a skills or competencies type conversation? It's not something we've talked about, you know, expressly at any of our executive committee members or, or meetings, but um, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, if we talk skills and competencies, most folks have a better sense of what that looks like and what that means for students. And so if, if that's the direction we're going to go, certainly something that we can um, bring to exec and, and talk about in uh, committees and at plenary, uh, you know, evolving with the field. I think that's an important thing to be able to do. Uh, a Rostrum article would be a good good way to start that. Absolutely, Yark. Yes. Okay, we can we can certainly work on that. Yep. Thank you, Cheryl. In fact, we're gearing up for plenary right now, so Rostrum mm -hmm. resolutions, all of those things are are good things to get engaged in at the moment. Nice. Nice. Very. Yes. It's it's you know another another part since I have you here. Uh, you know, Catherine yesterday um, uh, asked, kind of like set the tone for our discussion of, of, of among the panelists, asking about the value of higher education, you know, and, and um, we seem to be always so accountability driven, you know, and we are kind of like, you know, yes, let's explain this rule, let's explain this regulation, let's make sure we stick to this law. You know where where are we with 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 the 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 sort of like keeping bigger picture in mind, right? Uh, what's going on with 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 our students? How do we communicate to them? Guess what? Education matters. You know, just 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 if, if nothing else, the 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 need is definitely there. Dr. Lowe mentioned what was it? Forty some percent of students, you know, who are still 
either not sure or, or you know why should I go back to college kind of a thing. So how how do you see this discussion in the mix of your of of, of your you know again coming up considering plenary is coming up and whatnot. You know, I, I think one thing that the system uh, needs to do more of is uh, have more uh, qualitative data, especially from mm -hmm. students who are older, who have come back to school and for whatever reason, they didn't go, go to school immediately and they lived their lives. And then they found out later that once they went back to school and got their associates or their, you know, and then that led to bachelors and, and further, uh, that their lives changed. And right. I, I think that's that's the story that needs to be told um, because a lot of young younger students, especially nowadays, um, and I'm talking people in my family, young people in my family, they see school as sort of like a task or something that's outside of things that they want to do at the moment. And they don't know, you know, how it's going to change their lives if they were able to go ahead and complete some type of program uh, or degree or certificate, even at the uh, community college level, which is uh, highly overlooked, I think, uh, for years and decades, it's been highly overlooked, you know, as a um, a place to jumpstart your uh, your successful future. And so that story, those stories, I think, are what we need to do more more of uh, across the system, uh, drawing from those success stories and life changing events uh, that occurred with our with our older students who who come to us later in life. Our institutions have been shifting. I think as you think about the marketing that occurs in our system, it's always just been the community colleges can do this for you. Uh, that hasn't resonated. It hasn't driven enrollment. Um, but what are you starting to see? More of the I can afford college, the I stories, the students themselves. Uh, you're starting to see uh, at the system level, at least, more marketing across ethnic groups. Uh, at our local colleges, you're seeing more of the centering of those student stories and, and achievements in their voice, in their words, uh, so that students can see themselves more in not what have always been framed as institutional outcomes, like, hey, we graduated X number of students, yay for the institution, but more about I as a student have achieved this because of what I did at X college. Um, and, you know, if, if you think back, our, our private uh, colleges, uh, particularly those that are for profit, have been marketing that way for a long time and it works. And you know we've been really slow to adjust both at the state level and the local level, and you know education isn't marketing and marketing isn't education. And I'd like to think that what goes on in the classroom is rich enough and valuable enough to draw folks in, but they don't know it and they don't if they're not don't have an experience with education, they don't trust it. Um, and so you know what can we do to to um, increase marketing efforts at our colleges because it's often a trade off. Do we, you know, do something for the grounds or facilities? Do we do something for the classroom or do we invest this money in marketing? And, you know, a lot of our colleges invest a little bit there and then move the rest into what feels like more direct contact to students. But as we talk, uh, you know, Aisha mentioned the roadmap and the 70% degree attainment for Californians. As we think about, you know, continuing not just to drive enrollment, but really to serve our communities, we have to our communities have to see themselves in us and a huge part of that is the marketing effort and then for us as practitioners it's got to be how are we framing and how are we truly doing student-centered education so that it is education for and and with students rather um, than just you know two students in that sense uh yeah alpa I, I i agree with you a uh, job placement is also a very important thing to focus on and i know in in our guided pathways efforts and uh, some colleges have uh, program mappers on their websites that link their degrees and, and certificate programs directly uh, to the working wages uh, out in the various fields. And, and I think that's something too that needs to be, be pushed as well as when we reach down into our feeder high schools and, and, and middle schools that we're you know, bringing them into what's happening now with education versus what, uh, uh, whatever story they may be getting from maybe somebody you know, who's gone to school a long time ago. So there's a lot of change happening. And I think we have to like Cheryl say, market those changes and those, you know, whether it's 
you know, idea or DEI work in curriculum, uh, whether CBE, you know, OER, you know, all of these things uh, have to, we have to reach down into those feeder schools and let them know that we're doing all this work to make our community colleges uh, a better place and a more affordable place for, for them to jumpstart their, their futures. Yeah, Amanda, to your point about early childhood education, like th there's very little that's as critical as a, a young person's first years in education. And that starts with early childhood education. And yet it is one of the lowest paying jobs uh, in our society. And because it's low paying, it's not one of the top 10 sectors that our chancellor's office has identified as for value uh, for our students. And yet what's, what, what else is more valuable than that? Um, and so it actually got brought up at Board of Governors by a couple different people last week in comments about, you know, we've got to recognize that not at all of our students' destinies are going to be high wage earning jobs. One, as a society, we've got to place more wage value in uh, roles like early childhood education. But as educators and as a system, we need to boost that as a sector. We need to be driving students towards it because they'll make a difference in our communities tomorrow. So yeah. I just... I don't want to cut everyone off, but we're we're pretty much at the end of our time here, and I um I know this probably could go on for a really long time, but I just want to say uh, thank you so much to Cheryl and to Robert for spending time with us, for answering um, our questions, and for bringing so much information to us because I know that um, both of you are doing a lot of really good work at ASCCC and really making sure that um, our voices as faculty are being lifted and that um you know we're, we're involved in all the things that we need to be involved in so i just really appreciate that so i'm going to hand it back to yarek to kind of wrap this up but thank you so much for your time we appreciate it thank you it's always you for having us. right on thank you guys this is this 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 really uh thank you very much for for wrapping it up for us this this concludes our our 10th annual sll symposium so um we are all going to see you uh, next year uh, Cheryl, Robert, cannot thank you enough for your ongoing support. You are always there uh, whenever whenever we need to talk to Academic Senate. We always know where to find you, and you're always responsive. So thank you very much. Grateful, grateful for, for all your help and sharing of your expertise. All right, then. Well, this moves us to our final uh, point of, 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 of our program. Uh, that would be a conversation about a, a evaluation about what, what, what happened today. We had a similar conversation yesterday. Uh, today, all, all we really, if, if you have any comments about what you think uh, went well uh, and what could could be improved for next time, uh, again, I would like to extend my, my gratitude to, to Susie Nitzel and, 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 and people from Fresno City College who've been uh, coordinating this on the, uh, from, from the technology uh, part. Uh, I tell you, it all worked smoothly on my end. There was there was just no 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 glitches in the system whatsoever. So kudos to Susie and others who have helped her, Enrique and uh, Don Lopez from um, Fresno City, Poly City College who are supporting the event. We are just so extremely great, grateful uh, for for all your work, guys. Uh, so I, I, if, if if there are any questions, comments regarding this the, the evaluation part, what 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 do you think could be done differently, perhaps as as this segment of the uh, symposium is concerned. We had uh, uh, four presentations uh, by speakers back to back. We 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 make sure that that we have you know five five minute breaks in between. So I think that that worked well. Well, I I haven't heard anything from anybody to 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 the to the contrary. And the lineup I think was 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 quite meaningful. We have uh, uh, speakers from pretty much all walks of lives that that uh, uh, in 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 our. Uh, in our respective fields, uh, we had accreditation, institutional effectiveness, academic senate, uh, chancellor's office. I don't know if this needs to be uh, changed in any different way. If there is anything that 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 needs to be articulated better, uh, any, any any thoughts, questions, suggestions, anybody? We had a great suggestion in the chat, Yarek, um, uh -huh. from Rebecca Slate, to have a brand new coordinator um breakout session next year oh. for those just entering i think that's an excellent idea rebecca and you can sure. always reach out on the coaches website there is a, a request for support form that is on there and any of the coaches would be happy to to support you and, and answer any of those questions you have as a new coordinator we have all been there um and all not had the support that we needed so we are here um to support you 
Indeed, fantastic idea. Absolutely, we'll make it happen. As a matter of fact, we have more than enough people now to start that that that, that breakout session. It could be even you know uh, two or three of us, right, moderating the discussion, and and I'm sure it would be a, a fantastic one. So that's that's that that is truly a needed and timely um, suggestion. Perfect, Jarek. I just want to thank the uh, yes. uh, the interpreters, ASL interpreters, uh, Jan and uh, Amber. Please, thank you so much. For doing that, and Susie, once again, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. But you're, you're it, okay. So, and once again, uh, I extend a uh, tremendous uh, gratitude to our attendees. Uh, they're the ones who are making it happen. So, thank you so much for attending and taking an interest. Excellent. And the the recordings are going to be available on Fresno City College website, right? And professional development tab there. And, and we are going to post them on YouTube. So there's going to be links from the coaches website as well. Uh, Samanda mentioned we have a blog there going. We try to, to jumpstart it, make sure that, that it's a meaningful way to communicate uh, uh, the, 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 the newest and the latest, as, as, as we can see that, you know, the landscape of, of student learning and, 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 and teaching are, are, are issues that, that are bound to change yet one more time with, with really uh, huge waves, uh, ripple effect, uh, causing causing all kinds of different um, questions to be asked. And, and let's just leave it at that. So we certainly would like to engage everyone in the ongoing discussion. And the Friday SLO talks are going to come back uh, probably around February, right? After today, we'll, we'll get together with our coaches group and start planning for the spring semester and see where that takes us. So that's that's where we are in terms of Can our, I add to our that, Yarek? We're Please. always looking for presenters. If you have great ideas, um, if you saw great things within this uh, weekend, please let us know because um, I think you get tired of hearing from us all the time. It'd be great to bring new voices into that. So please reach out if you're interested. Absolutely. We have a lot of expertise going around. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's there's a lot of people with a lot to say on what's going on in our campuses. And as always, we are always uh, outcome driven. <laughs> we are always interested in, in, in what the what the uh, final goal is and what are the best practices and really how to make a difference for our faculty and students come Monday morning. So Thank you so much, everyone, for, for your participation, your efforts, your hard work, and Amanda, Enrique, Bethany. Um, oh, gosh, there's just, just all those coaches that, that, that have been so supportive of, of our work here. Thank you, all the guests again. We'll see you next year. Bye-bye. Thank you, York. Thank you, guys. Thank Take you. Care. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.